McGrath whirled away in the buffeting wind, clinging tightly to a broomstick which now, she feared, had about as much buoyancy as a bit of firewood. It certainly wasn't capable of sustaining a full-grown woman against the beckoning fingers of gravity. As she plunged down towards the forest roof, in a long, shallow dive, she reflected that there was possibly something complimentary in the way Granny Weatherwax resolutely refused to consider other people's problems. It implied that, in her considerable opinion, they were quite capable of sorting them out by themselves. Some kind of change spell was probably in order. McGrath concentrated. Well, that seemed to work. Nothing in the sight of mortal man had in fact changed. What McGrath had achieved was a mere adjustment of the mental processes, from a bewildered and slightly frightened woman gliding inexorably towards the inhospitable ground, to a clear-headed, optimistic and positive-thinking woman who had really got it together was taking full responsibility for her own life, and in general knew where she was coming from, although, unfortunately, where she was heading had not changed in any way, but she felt a lot better about it. She dug her heels in and forced the broomstick to yield the last dregs of its power in a brief burst, sending it skimming erratically a few feet from the trees. As it sagged again and started to plough a furrow among the midnight leaves as she tensed herself, prayed to whatever gods of the forest might be listening that she would land on something soft and let go. There are three thousand known major gods on the disc, and research theologians discover more every week. Apart from the minor gods of rock, tree and water, there are two that haunt the ramtops. Hokey, half a man, half a goat, and entirely a bad practical joker, who was banished from Dun Manifestin, for pulling the old exploding mistletoe joke on blind Eo, chief of all the gods, and also Hearn the Hunted, the terrified and apprehensive deity of all small furry creatures whose destiny it is to end their lives as a brief, crunchy squeak. Either could have been candidates for the small miracle which then occurred, for in a forest full of cold rocks, jagged stumps and thorn bushes, McGrath landed on something soft. Granny, meanwhile, was accelerating towards the mountains on the second leg of the journey. She consumed the regrettably tepid cocoa and, with proper environmental consideration, dropped the bottle as she passed over an upland lake. It turned out that McGrath's idea of sustaining food was two rounds of egg and cress sandwiches with the crusts cut off, and Granny noticed before the wind whipped it away a small piece of parsley placed with consideration and care on top of each one. Granny regarded them for some time. Then she ate them. A chasm loomed, still choked with winter snow, like a tiny spark in the darkness, a dot of light against the hugeness of the ramptops. Granny tackled the maze of the mountains. Back in the forest, McGrath sat up and absent-mindedly pulled a twig from her hair. A few yards away, the broomstick dropped through the trees, showering leaves. A groan and a small half-hearted tinkle caused her to peer into the gloom. An instinct figure was on its hands and knees searching for something. Did I land on you? said McGrath. Someone did, said the fool. They crawled nearer to one another. You? You? What are you doing here? Mary, I was walking along the ground, said the fool. A lot of people do. You know what I mean? I know it's been done before. It's not original. Probably lacks imagination, but, well, it's always been good enough for me. Did I hurt you? I think I've got one or two bells that won't be the same again. The fool scrabbled through the leaf mould and finally located his hated hat. It clonked. Totally crushed to faith, he said, putting it on anyway. He seemed to feel better for that and went on, Rain, yes. Hail, yes. Even lumps of rock. Fish and small frogs, okay. Women, no, up till now. Is it going to happen again? You've got a bloody hard head, said McGrath, pulling herself to her feet. Modesty forbids me to come, said the fool, and then remembered himself and added quickly, Pretty. 
They stared at one another again, their minds racing. McGrath thought, Nanny said look at him properly. I'm looking at him. He just looks the same. A sad, thin little man in a ridiculous jester's outfit. He's practically a hunchback. Then, in the same way that a few random bulges in a cloud can suddenly become a galleon or a whale in the eye of the beholder, McGrath realised that the fool was not a little man. He was at least of average height, but he made himself small by hunching his shoulders, bandying his legs, and walking in a half-crouch that made him appear as though he was capering on the spot. I wonder what else Geither Og noticed, she thought, intrigued. He rubbed his arm and gave her a lopsided grin. I suppose you haven't got any idea where we are, he said. Witches never get lost, said McGrath firmly. Although they can become temporarily mislaid. Longcra's over that way, I think. I've got to find a hill, if you'll excuse me. To see where you are? To see when, I think. There's a lot of magic going on tonight. Is there? Then I think I'll accompany you, the fool added chivalrously, after peering cautiously into the tree-haunted gloom that apparently lay between him and his flagstones. I wouldn't want anything to happen to you. Granny lay low over the broomstick as it plunged through the trackless chasms of the mountains, leaning from side to side in the hope that this may have some effect on the steering, which seemed strangely to be getting worse. Falling snow behind her was whipped and spiralled into odd shapes by the wind of her passage. Rearing waves of crusted snow poised all winter over the glacial valleys, trembled, and then began the long, silent fall. Her flight was punctuated by the occasional boom of an avalanche. She looked down at the landscape of sudden death and jagged beauty, and knew it was looking back at her as a dozing man may watch a mosquito. She wondered if it realised what she was doing. She wondered if it would make her fall any softer, and mentally scolded herself for such softness. Oh, the land wasn't like that. It didn't bargain. The land gave hard and took hard. A dog always bit deepest on the veterinary hand. And then she was through, vaulting so low over the last peak that one of her boots filled with snow, and barrelling down towards the lowlands. The mist, never far away in the mountains, was back again, but this time it was making a fight of it, and had become a thick, silver sea in front of her. She groaned. Somewhere in the middle of it, Nanny Og floated, taking the occasional pull from a hip flask, as a preventative against the chill. And thus it was that Granny, her hat and iron-grey hair dripping with moisture, her boots shedding lumps of ice, heard the distant and muffled sound of a voice enthusiastically explaining to the invisible sky that the hedgehog had less to worry over than just about any other mammal. Like a hawk that has spotted something small and fluffy in the grass, like a wandering interstellar flu germ that has just seen a nice blue planet drifting by, Granny turned the stick and plunged down through the choking billows. Come on! she screamed, drunk with speed and exhilaration, and the sound from five hundred feet overhead put a passing wolf severely off its supper. This minute, Geyser Og! Nanny Og caught her hand with considerable reluctance, and the pair of broomsticks swept up again and into the clear, starlit sky. The disc, as always, gave the impression that the Creator has designed it specifically to be looked at from above. Streamers of cloud in white and silver stretched away to the rim, stirred into thousand-mile swirls by the turning of the world. Behind the speeding brooms, the sullen roof of the fog was dragged up into a curling tunnel of white vapour so that the watching gods, and they were certainly watching, could see the terrible flight as a furrow in the sky. A thousand feet and rising fast into the frosty air, the two witches were bickering again. It was a bloody stupid idea, moaned Nanny. I never liked heights. 
Did you bring something to drink? Certainly, you said. Well, I drank it, didn't I? Said Nanny. Sitting around up there at my age, our Jason would have a fit. Granny gritted her teeth. Well, let's have the power, she said. I'm running out of up. Amazing how... <coughs> Granny's voice ended in a scream as, without any warning at all, her broomstick pinwheeled sharply across the clouds and dropped from sight. The fool and McGrath sat on a log on a small outcrop that looked out across the forest. The lights of Lancre Town were in fact not very far away, but neither of them had suggested leaving. The air between them crackled with unspoken thoughts and wild surmisings. You've been a fool long? said McGrat politely. She blushed in the darkness. In that atmosphere, it sounded the most impolite of questions. All my life, said the fool bitterly. I cut my teeth on a set of bells. I suppose it gets handed on from father to son, said McGrat. I never saw much of my father. He went off to be a fool for the lords of Quorum when I was small, said the fool. Had a row with my granddad. He comes back from time to time to see my man. That's terrible. There was a sad jingle as the fool shrugged. He vaguely recalled his father as a short, friendly little man, with eyes like a couple of oysters. Doing something as brave as standing up to the old boy must have been quite outside his nature. The sound of two suits of bells shaken in anger still haunted his memory, which was full enough of bad scenes as it was. Still, said McGrath, her voice higher than usual with a vibrato of uncertainty. It must have been a happy life, making people laugh, I mean. When there was no reply, she turned to look at the man. His face was like stone. In a low voice, talking as though she was not there, the fool spoke. He spoke of the Guild of Fools and Joculators of Ankh Morpork. Most visitors mistook it at first for the offices of the Guild of Assassins, which in fact was the rather pleasant, airy collection of buildings next door. The Assassins always had plenty of money. Sometimes the young fools, slaving at their rote in rooms that were always freezing, even in high summer, heard the young assassins at play over the war and envied them, even though, of course, the number of piping voices grew noticeably fewer towards the end of term. The assassins also believed in competitive examination. In fact, all sorts of sounds managed to breach the high, grim, windowless walls, and from keen questioning of servants, the younger fools picked up a vision of the city beyond. There were taverns out there and parks. There was a whole bustling world in which the students and apprentices of the various guilds and colleges took a right part, either by playing tricks on it, running through it shouting, or throwing parts of it up. There was laughter which paid no attention to the five cadences or twelve inflections, and... Although the students debated this news in the dormitories at night, there was apparently unauthorised humour, delivered freestyle, with no reference to the monster fun book, or the council, or anyone. Out there, beyond the stained stonework, people were telling jokes without reference to the lords of misrule. It was a sobering thought, well, not a sobering thought in actual fact, because alcohol wasn't allowed in the guild. But if it was, it would have been. There was nowhere more sober than the Guild. The fool spoke bitterly of the huge, red-faced brother prankster, of evenings learning the merry jests, of long mornings in the freezing gymnasium, learning the eighteen pratfalls and the accepted trajectory for a custard pie, and juggling, juggling. Brother Jape, a man with a soul like cold boiled string, taught juggling. It wasn't that the fool was bad at juggling that reduced him to incoherent fury. Fools were expected to be bad at juggling, especially if juggling inherently funny items like custard pies, flaming torches, or extremely sharp cleavers. What had Brother Jape laying about him in red-hot, clinging rage was the fact that the fool was bad because he wasn't any good at it. 
you want to be anything else? said McGrath. What else is there? said the fool. I haven't seen anything else I could be. Student fools were allowed out in the last year of training, but under a fearsome set of restrictions. Capering miserably through the streets, he'd seen wizards for the first time, moving like dignified carnival floats. He'd seen the surviving assassins, foppish, giggling young men in black silk, as sharp as knives underneath. He'd seen priests, their fantastic costumes only slightly marred by the long, rubber, sacrificial aprons they wore for major services. Every trade and profession had its costume, he saw, and he realised for the first time that the uniform he was wearing had been carefully and meticulously designed for no other purpose than making its wearer look like a complete and utter pillock. Even so, he'd persevered. He'd spent his whole life persevering. He'd persevered precisely because he had absolutely no talent, and because his grandfather would have flayed him alive if he didn't. He'd memorised the authorised jokes until his head rang, and got up even earlier in the morning to juggle until his elbows creaked. He had perfected his grasp of comic vocabulary until only the very senior lords could understand him. He'd capered and clowned with an impenetrable, grim determination, and he'd graduated top of his year, and had been awarded the bladder of honour. He'd dropped it down the privy when he came home. McGrath was silent. The fool said, How did you get to be a wedge? Um, I mean, did you go to school or something? Oh, no. Goody Wemper just walked down to the village one day, got all us girls lined up and chose me. You don't choose the craft, you see. It chooses you. Yes, but when do you actually become a wedge? When the other witches treat you as one, I suppose. McGrath sighed. <sighs> if they ever do, she added. I thought they would after I did that spell in the corridor. It was pretty good after all. Marry, t'was a rite of passage, said the fool, unable to stop himself. McGrath gave him a blank look. He coughed. <coughs> the other witches being those two old ladies he said, relapsing into his usual gloom. Yes. Very strong characters, I imagine. Very, said McGrath with feeling. I wonder if they ever met my grandad, said the fool. McGrath looked at her feet. They're quite nice, really, she said. It's just that, well, when you're a witch, you don't think about other people. I mean, you think about them, but you don't actually think about their feelings if you see what I mean. At least, not unless you think about it. She looked at her feet again. You're not like that, said the fool. Look, I wish you'd stop working for the Duke, said McGrath desperately. You know what he's like, torturing people and setting fire to their cottages and everything. But I'm his fool, said the fool. A fool has to be loyal to his master right up until he dies. I'm afraid it's tradition. Tradition is very important. But you don't even like being a fool. I hate it. But that's got nothing to do with it. If I've got to be a fool, I'll do it properly. That's really stupid, said McGrath. Foolish, I'd prefer. The fool had been edging along the log. If I kiss you, he added carefully, do I turn into a frog? McGrath looked down at her feet again. They shuffled themselves under her dress embarrassed at all this attention. She could sense the shades of Gytha Og and Esme Weatherwax on either side of her. Granny Spectre glared at her. A witch is master of every situation, it said. Miss Dress, said the vision of Nanny Og, and made a brief gesture involving much grinning and waving of forearms. We shall have to see, she said. It was destined to be the most impressive kiss in the history of foreplay. Time, as Granny Weatherworks had pointed out, is a subjective experience. The fool's years in the guild had been an eternity, whereas the hours with McGrath on the hilltop passed like a couple of minutes, and high above Lancre, 
a double handful of seconds extended like taffy into hours of screaming terror. Ice! screamed Granny. It's iced up! Nanny Og came alongside, trying vainly to match courses with the tumbling, bucking broomstick. Octrin fire crackled over the frozen bristles, shorting them out at random. She leaned over and snatched a handful of Granny's skirt. I told you it was daft, she shouted. You went all through all that wet mist, and then up into the cold air, you daft bism. You let go of my skirt, Gaither Og. Come on, grab hold of mine. You're on fire at the back there. They shot through the bottom of the cloud bank and screamed in unison as the shrub-covered ground emerged from nowhere and aimed itself directly at them, and went past. Nanny looked down a black perspective, at the bottom of which a boil of white water was dimly visible. They had flown over the edge of Longra Gorge. Blue smoke was pouring out of Granny's broomstick, but she hung on, determined, and forced it around. What the hell are you doing? roared Nanny. I can follow the river! Granny Weatherwax screamed above the crackle of flames. Don't you worry! You come aboard, you hear? It's all over! You can't do it! There was a small explosion behind Granny, and several handfuls of burning bristles broke off and whirled away into the booming depths of the gorge. Her stick jerked sideways, and Nanny grabbed her around the shoulders as a gout of fire snapped off another binding. The blazing broomstick shot from between her legs, twisted in the air, and went straight upwards, trailing sparks and making a noise like a wet finger dragged around the top of a wine glass. This left Nanny flying upside down, supporting Granny Weatherwax at arm's length. They stared into one another's faces and screamed, I can't pull you up! Well, I can't climb up, can I, at your age, Gaitha? Nanny considered this. Then she let go. Three marriages and an adventurous girlhood had left Nanny Og with thigh muscles that could crack coconuts, and the G-forces sucked her as she forced the speeding stick down and around in a tight loop. Ahead of her, she made out Granny Weatherwax dropping like a stone, one hand clutching her hat, the other trying to prevent gravity from seeing up her skirts. She urged the stick forwards until it creaked, snatched the falling witch around the waist, fought the plunging stick back up to level flight, and sagged. The subsequent silence was broken by Granny Weatherwax saying, Don't you ever do that again, Gaitha Og. I promise. Now turn us around. We're heading for Lonkra Bridge, remember? Nanny obediently turned the broomstick, brushing the canyon walls as she did so. It's still miles to go, she said. I mean to do it, said Granny. There's plenty of night left. Not enough, I'm thinking. A witch doesn't know the meaning of the word failure, Geiter. They shot up into the clear air again. The horizon was a line of golden light as the slow dawn of the disk sped across the land, bulldozing the suburbs of the night. Esme, said Nanny Og after a while. What? It means lack of success. They flew in chilly silence for several seconds. I was speaking, what's name, figuratively, said Granny. Oh, well, you should have said. The line of light was bigger, brighter. For the first time, a flicker of doubt invaded Granny Weatherwax's mind, puzzled to find itself in such unfamiliar surroundings. I wonder how many cockerels there are in Lankra, she said quietly. Was that one of them was name questions? I was just wondering. Nanny Og sat back. There were thirty-two of crowing age she knew. She knew because she'd worked it out last night. Tonight. And had given Jason his instructions. She had fifteen grown-up children and innumerable grandchildren and great-grandchildren. 
They had most of the evening to get into position. Should be enough. Did you hear that? said Granny. Over Razorback Way. Nanny looked innocently across the misty landscape. Sound travelled very clearly in these early hours. What? she said. Sort of an irk noise. No. Granny spun around. Over there, she said. I definitely heard it this time. Something like cock a doodle or ah! Can't say I did, Esme, said Nanny, smiling at the sky. Long for a bridge up ahead. And over there, right down there, it was a definite squawk. Dawn chorus, Esme, I expect. Look, only half a mile to go. Granny glared at the back of her colleague's head. There's something going on here, she said. Search me, Esme. Your shoulders are shaking. Lost my shawl back there. I'm a bit chilly. Look, we're nearly here. Granny glared ahead, her mind a maze of suspicions. She was going to get to the bottom of this when she had time. The damp logs of Lonkra's main link to the outside world drifted gently underneath them. From the chicken farm half a mile away, came a chorus of strangled squawks and a thud. And that? What was that, then? demanded Granny. Foul pest. Careful, I'm bringing us down. Are you laughing at me? Just pleased for you, Esme. You'll go down in history for this, you know. They drifted between the timbers of the bridge. Granny Weatherwax alighted cautiously on the greasy planking and adjusted her dress. Yes, well, she added nonchalantly. Better than Black Alice, everyone will say, Nanny Og went on. Some people will say anything, said Granny. She peered over the parapet at the foaming torrent far below, and then up at the distant outcrop on which stood Blanca Castle. Do you think they will? she added nonchalantly. Mark my words. Hmm. But you've got to complete the spell, mind. Granny Weatherwax nodded. She turned to face the dawn, raised her arms, and completed the spell. It is almost impossible to convey the sudden passage of fifteen years and two months in words. It's a lot easier in pictures, where you can just use a calendar with lots of pages blowing off, or a clock with the hands moving faster and faster until they blur, or trees bursting into blossom and fruiting in a matter of seconds. Well, you know. Or the sun becomes a fiery streak across the sky, and days and nights flicker past jerkily like a bad zoetrope, and the fashions visible in the clothes shop across the road whip on and off faster than a lunchtime stripper with five pubs to do. There are any amount of ways, but they won't be required because, in fact, none of this happened. The sun did jerk sideways a bit, and it seemed that the trees on the rimwood side of the gorge were rather taller, and Nanny couldn't shake off the sensation that someone had just sat down heavily on her, squashed her flat, and then opened her out again. This was because the kingdom did not, in so many words, move through time in the normal flickering sky, high-speed photography sense of the word. It moved around it, which is much cleaner considerably easier to achieve, and saves all that travelling around trying to find a laboratory opposite a dress shop that will keep the same dummy in the window for sixty years, which has traditionally been the most time-consuming and expensive bit of the whole business. The kiss lasted more than fifteen years. Not even frogs can manage that. The fool drew back, his eyes glazed, his expression one of puzzlement. Did you feel the world move? he said. McGrath peered over his shoulder at the forest. I think she's done it, she said. Done what? McGrath hesitated. Oh, nothing. Nothing much, really. Shall we have another try? I don't think we quite got it right that time. McGrath nodded. This time it lasted only fifteen seconds seemed longer. 
A tremor ran through the castle, shaking the breakfast tray from which the Duke Felmet, much to his relief, was eating porridge that wasn't too salty. It was felt by the ghosts that now filled Nanny Og's cottage like a rugby team in a telephone box. It spread to every hen house in the kingdom, and a number of hands relaxed their grip, and thirty-two purple-faced cockerels took a deep breath and crowed like maniacs, but they were too late. Too late. I still reckon you were up to something, said Granny Weatherwax. Have another cup of tea, said Nanny pleasantly. You won't go and put any drink in it, will you? Granny said flatly. It was the drink what did it last night. I would never have put myself forward like that. It's shameful. Black Alice never done anything like it, said Nanny encouragingly. I mean, it was a hundred years, all right, but it was only one castle she moved. I reckon anyone could do a castle. Granny's frown puckered at the edge. And she let all weeds grow over it, she observed primly. Right enough. Very well done, said King Lorenz eagerly. We all thought it was superb. Being in the ethereal plane, of course, we were in a position to observe closely. Very good, your graciousness, said Nanny Og. She turned and observed the crowding ghosts behind him, who hadn't been granted the privilege of sitting at, or partly through, the kitchen table. But you lot can back her off back to the outhouse, she said. The cheek. Except the kiddies. They can stay, she added. Poor little mites. I'm afraid it feels so good to be out of the castle, said the king. Granny Weatherwax yawned. Anyway, she said, we've got to find the boy now. That's the next step. We shall look for him directly after lunch. Lunch? It's chicken, said Nanny. And you're tired. Besides, making a decent search will take a long time. He'll be an ark more pork, said Granny. Mark my words, everyone ends up there. We'll start with ark more pork. You don't have to search for people when destiny is involved. You just wait for them in ark more pork. Nanny brightened up. Ah, Karen got married to an innkeeper from there. I haven't seen the baby yet. We could get free board and everything. We needn't actually go. The whole point is that he should come here. There's something about that city, said Granny. It's like a drain. It's five hundred miles away, said Magrat. You'll be away for ages. I can't help it, said the fool. The Duke's given me special instructions. He trusts me. Ha! Huh. To hire more soldiers, I expect. No, nothing like that. Not as bad as that. The fool hesitated. He'd introduced Felmut to the world of words. Surely that was better than hitting people with swords. Wouldn't that buy time? Wouldn't it be best for everybody, in the circumstances? But you don't have to go. You don't want to go. That doesn't have much to do with it. I promise to be loyal to him. Yes, yes, until you're dead. But you don't even believe that. You were telling me how much you hated the whole guild and everything. Well, yes, but I still have to do it. I gave my word. Magrat came close to stamping her foot, but didn't sink so low. Just when we were getting to know one another, she shouted. You're pathetic! The fool's eyes narrowed. I'd only be pathetic if I broke my word, he said. But I may be incredibly ill-advised. I'm sorry. I'll be back in a few weeks, anyway. Don't you understand? I'm asking you not to listen to him. I said I'm sorry. I couldn't see you again before I go, could I? I'll be washing my hair, said McGrath stiffly. When? Whenever. Howell pinched the bridge of his nose and squinted wearily at the wax-spattered paper. The play wasn't going well at all. He'd sorted out the falling chandelier, and found a place for a villain who wore a mask to conceal his disfigurement, 
and he'd one of the funny bits to allow for the fact that the hero had been born in a handbag. It was the clowns who were giving him trouble again. They kept changing every time he thought about them. He preferred them in twos, that was traditional, but now there seemed to be a third one, and he was blowed if he could think of any funny lines for him. His quill moved scratchily over the latest sheet of paper, trying to catch the voices that had streamed through his dreaming mind, and it seemed so funny at the time. His tongue began to stick out of the corner of his mouth. He was sweating. This is my little study, he wrote. Hey, with a little study, you could go a long way, and I wish you'd start now. If you can't leave in a cab, then leave in a half. If that's too soon, then leave in a minute and a half. Say, you got a pencil? A crayon? Hal stared at this in horror. On the page it looked nonsensical, ridiculous, and yet, and yet, in the thronged auditorium of his mind, he dipped the quill in the ink pot and chased the echoes further. Second clown. That's a right, boss. Third clown. Business with blood on stick. Honk, honk. Howell gave up. Yes, it was funny. He knew it was funny. He'd heard the laughter in his dreams, but it wasn't right. Not yet. Maybe never. It was like the other idea he had about two clowns. One fat, one thin. This is a mean, dainty mess you've gotten me into, Stanley. He had laughed until his chest ached, and the rest of the company had looked at him in astonishment, but in his dreams it was hilarious. He laid down the pen and rubbed his eyes. It must be nearly midnight. And the habit of a lifetime told him to spare the candles, although, for a fact, they could afford all the candles they could eat now, whatever Vitola might say. Our gongs were being struck all across the city, and night watchmen were proclaiming that it was indeed midnight, and also that, in the face of all the evidence, all was well. Many of them got as far as the end of the sentence before being mugged. Howell pushed open the shutters and looked out at Ark Moorpork. It would be tempting to say the Twin City was at its best this time of year, but that wouldn't be entirely correct. It was at its most typical. The River Ankh, the cloaca of half a continent, was already pretty wide and silt-laden when it reached the city's outskirts. By the time it left, it didn't so much flow as exude. Owing to the accretion of the mud of centuries, the bed of the river was in fact higher than some of the low-lying areas, and now, with the snowmelt swelling the flow, many of the low-rent districts of the Moor Pork side were flooded if you can use that word for a liquid you could pick up in a net. This sort of thing happened every year and would have caused havoc with the drains and the sewage systems, so it is just as well that the city didn't have very many. Its inhabitants merely kept a punt handy in the backyard and periodically built another story on the house. It was reckoned to be very healthy there. Very few germs were able to survive. Howell looked across a sort of misty sea in which buildings clustered like a sandcastle competition at high tide. Flares and lighted windows made pleasing patterns on the iridescent surface. But there was one glare of light, much closer to hand, which particularly occupied his attention. On a patch of slightly higher ground by the river, bought by Vitola for a ruinous sum, a new building was rising. It was growing even by night, like a mushroom. Howell could see the cressets burning all along the scaffolding as the hired craftsmen, and even some of the players themselves, refused to let the mere shade of the sky interrupt their labours. New buildings were rare in Moorpork, but this was even a new type of building. The disc. Vitola had been aghast at the idea at first, but young Tom John had kept at him, and everyone knew that once the lad had got the feel of it, he could persuade water to flow uphill. But we've always moved around, laddie, said Vitola in the desperate voice of one who knows that at the end of it all he's going to lose the argument. I can't go around settling down at my time of life. It's not doing you any good, said Tom John firmly. All these cold nights and frosty mornings, you're not getting any younger. We 
should stay put somewhere. People come to us. And they will, too. You know the crowds we're getting now? Howell's plays are famous. It's not my plays, Howell had said. It's the players. I can't see me sitting by a fire in a stuffy room and sleeping on feather beds and all that nonsense, said Vitola. But he'd seen the look on his wife's face and had given in. And then there had been the theatre itself. Making water run uphill was a parlour trick compared to getting cash out of the toller, but it was a fact that they had been doing well these days. Ever since Tom John had been big enough to wear a ruff and say two words without his voice cracking. Howell and Vitola had watched the first few beams of the wooden framework go up. It's against nature, Vitola had complained, leaning on his stick. Capturing the spirit of the theatre, putting it in a cage, it'll kill it. Oh, I don't know, said Howell diffidently. Tom John had laid his plans well. He'd devoted an entire evening to Howell before even broaching the subject to his father, and now the dwarf's mind was on fire with the possibilities of backdrops and scenery changes and wings and flies and magnificent engines that could lower gods from the heavens and trapdoors that could raise demons from hell. Howell was no more capable of objecting to the new theatre than a monkey was of resenting a banana plantation. Damn thing! Hasn't even got a name! Patola had said. I should call it the gold mine, because that's what it's costing me. Where's the money going to come from? That's what I'd like to know. In fact, they'd tried a lot of names, none of which suited Tom John. It's got to be a name that means everything, he said. Because there's everything inside it. The whole world on the stage, do you see? And Howell had said, knowing as he said it, that what he was saying was exactly right. The disc. And now the disc was nearly done, and still he hadn't written the new play. He shut the window and wandered back to his desk picked up the quill, and pulled another sheet of paper towards him. A thought struck him. The whole world was a stage, to the gods. Presently he began to write. All the disc, it is but a theatre, he wrote, and all men and women are but players. He made the mistake of pausing, and another inspiration sleeted down, sending his train of thought off along an entirely new track. He looked at what he'd written and added, Except those who sell popcorn. After a while he crossed this out and tried, Like unto the stage of a theatre is the world, whereon all persons strut as players. This seemed a bit better. He thought for a bit and continued conscientiously, Sometimes they walk on, sometimes they walk off. He seemed to be losing it. Time, time, what he needed was an infinity. There was a muffled cry and a thump from the next room. Howell dropped the quill and pushed open the door cautiously. The boy was sitting up in bed, white-faced. He relaxed when Howell came in. Howell? What's up, lad? Nightmares? God, it was terrible. I saw them again. I really thought for a minute that... Howell, who was absent-mindedly picking up the clothes that Tom John had strewn around the room, paused in his work. He was keen on dreams. That was when the ideas came. But what? He said. It was like... I mean... I was sort of inside something like a bowl, and there were these three terrible faces peering in at me. I? Yes, and then they all said, All hail. And then they started arguing about my name, and then they said, Anyway, who shall be king hereafter? And then one of them said, Hereafter what? And one of the other two said, Just hereafter, girl. That's what you're supposed to say in these circumstances. You might try and make an effort.
peered closer, and one of the others said, He looks a bit peaky. I reckon it's all that foreign food. And then the youngest one said, Nanny, I've told you already, there's no such place as Thespia. And then they bickered a bit, and one of the old ones said, He can't hear us, can he? He's tossing and turning a bit. And the other one said, You know, I've never been able to get sound on this thing, Esme. And then they bickered some more, and it went cloudy, and then I woke up, he finished lamely. It was horrible, because every time they came close to the bowl, it sort of magnified everything, so all you could see was eyes and nostrils. Howell hoisted himself onto the edge of the narrow bed. Funny old things, dreams, he said. Not much funny about that one. No, but I mean, last night I had this dream about a little bandy-legged man walking down a road, said Howell. He had a little black hat on, and he walked as though his boots were full of water. Tom John nodded politely. Yes, he said. And? Well, that was it. And nothing. He had this little cane which he twirled, and, you know, it was incredibly... Dwarf's voice trailed off. Tom John's face had that familiar expression of polite and slightly condescending puzzlement that Howell had come to know and dread. Anyway, it was very amusing, he said, half to himself. But he knew he'd never convinced the rest of the company. If it didn't have a custard pie in it somewhere, they said it wasn't funny. Tom John swung his legs out of bed and reached for his breeches. I'm not going back to sleep, he said. What's the time? It's after midnight, said Hal. And you know what your father said about going to bed late? I'm not, said Tom John, pulling on his boots. I'm getting up early. Getting up early is very healthy, and now I'm going out for a very healthy drink. You can come too, he added, to keep an eye on me. Howell gave him a doubting look. You also know what your father said about going out drinking, he said. Yes. He said he used to do it all the time when he was a lad. He said he'd think nothing of quaffing ale all night and coming home at 5 a.m., smashing windows. He said he was a bit of a royster-doyster, not like these white-livered people today who can't hold their drink. Tom John adjusted his doublet in front of the mirror and added, You know, Howell, I reckon responsible behavior is something you get when you grow older, like varicose veins. Howell sighed. Tom John's memory for ill-judged remarks was legendary. All right, he said. Just the one, though. Somewhere decent. I promise. Tom John adjusted his hat. It had a feather in it. By the way, he said, exactly how does one quaff? I think it means you spill most of it, said Hal. If the water of the River Ankh was rather thicker and more full of personality than ordinary river water, so the air in the mended drum was more crowded than normal air. It was like dry fog. Tom John and Howell watched it spilling out into the street. The door burst open and a man came through backwards, not actually touching the ground until he hit the wall on the opposite side of the street. An enormous troll employed by the owners to keep a measure of order in the place came out dragging two more limp bodies which he deposited on the cobbles, kicking them once or twice in soft places. I reckon they're roistering in there, don't you? said Tom John. It looks like that, said Hal. He shivered. He hated taverns. People always put their drinks down on his head. They scurried in quickly while the troll was holding one unconscious drinker up by one leg and banging his head on the cobbles in search for concealed valuables. Drinking in the drum has been likened to diving in a swamp, except that in the swamp the alligators don't pick your pockets first. Two hundred eyes watched the pair as they pushed their way through the crowd to the bar. A hundred mouths paused in the act of drinking, cursing or pleading, and ninety-nine brows crinkled with the effort of working out whether the newcomers fell into category A people to be frightened of, or B, people to frighten. Tom John walked through the crowd as though it was his property, and with the impetuosity of youth rapped on the bar. Impetuosity was not a survival trait, drum.
Two pints is your finest ale, landlord, he said, in tones so carefully judged that the barman was astonished to find himself obediently filling the first mug before the echoes had died away. Howell looked up. There was an extremely big man on his right, wearing the outside of several large bulls and more chains than necessary to moor a warship. A face that looked like a building site with hair on it glared down at him. Bloody hell, he said. It's a bloody lone ornament. Powell went cold. Cosmopolitan as they were, the people of Moorpork had a breezy, no-nonsense approach to the non-human races, i.e. hit them over the head with a brick and throw them in the river. This did not apply to trolls, naturally, because it's very difficult to be racially prejudiced against creatures seven feet tall who can bite through walls, at least for very long. But people three feet high were absolutely designed to be discriminated against. The giant prodded Howl on the top of his head. Where's your fishing rod, lone ornament? he said. The barman pushed the mugs across the puddled counter. Here you are, he said, leering. One pint and one half pint. Tom John opened his mouth to speak, but Howell nudged him sharply in the knee. Put up with it, put up with it. Slip out as soon as possible. It was the only way. Where's your little pointy at, then? said the bearded man. The room had gone quiet. This looked like being cabaret time. I said, where's your pointy at, dopey? The barman got a grip of the blackthorn stick with nails in it, which lived under the counter just in case, and said, Uh, I was talking to the lawn ornament here. The man took the dregs of his own drink and poured them carefully over the silent dwarf's head. I ain't drinking here again, he muttered. When even this failed to have any effect, it's bad enough they let monkeys drink here, but pig maze. Now the silence in the bar took on a whole new intensity in which the sound of a stool being slowly pushed back was like the creak of doom. All eyes swiveled to the other end of the room, where sat the one drinker in the mended drum who came into category C. What Tom John had thought was an old sack hunched over the bar was extending arms and other arms, except they were its legs. A sad, rubbery face turned towards the speaker, its expression as melancholy as the mists of evolution. Its funny lips curled back. There was absolutely nothing funny about its teeth. Uh, said the barman again, his voice frightening even him in that terrible simian silence. I don't think you meant that, did you? Not about monkeys, eh? You didn't really, did you? What the hell is that? Is Tom John. I think it's an orangutan, said Howell. An ape. A monkey is a monkey, said the bearded man, at which several of the drum's more percipient customers started to edge for the door. I mean, so what? But these bloody lone ornaments. Howell's fist struck out at groin height. Dwarfs have a reputation as fearsome fighters, any race of three-foot-tall people who favour axes and go into battle as into a championship tree-felling competition soon get talked about. But years of wielding a pen instead of a hammer had relieved Howell's punches of some of their stopping power. And it could have been the end of him when the big man yelled and drew his sword if a pair of delicate, leathery hands hadn't instantly jerked the thing from his grip and, with only a small amount of effort, bent it double. A explanation may be needed at this point. The librarian of the Magic Library at Unseen University, the DISC's premier college of wizardry, had been turned into an orangutan some years previously by a magical accident in that accident-prone academy, and since then had strenuously all well-meaning efforts to turn him back. 
For one thing, longer arms and prehensile toes made getting around the higher shelves a whole lot easier. And being an ape meant that you didn't have to bother with all this angst business. He had also been rather pleased to find that his new body, although looking deceptively like a rubber sack full of water, gave him three times the strength and twice the reach of his old one. When the giant growled and turned round, an arm like a couple of broom handles strung together with elastic and covered with red fur unfolded itself in a complicated motion and smacked him across the jaw so hard that he rose several inches in the air and landed on a table. By the time that the table had slid into another table and overturned a couple of benches, there was enough impetus to start the night's overdue brawl, especially since the big man had a few friends with him. Since no one felt like attacking the ape, who had dreamily pulled a bottle from the shelf and smashed the bottom off the counter, they hit whoever happened to be nearest, on general principles. This is absolutely correct etiquette for a tavern brawl. Howell walked under a table and dragged Tom John, who was watching all this with interest, after him. So this is Royce Trent. I always wondered. I think perhaps it would be a good idea to leave, said the dwarf firmly, before there's, you know, any trouble. There was a thump as someone landed on the table above them, and a tinkle of broken glass. Is it real, Rystrand, you suppose, or merely rollicking? said Tom John, grinning. It's going to be bloody murder in a minute, my lad. Tom John nodded and crawled back out into the fray. Hull heard him thump on the bar counter with something and call for silence. Hull put his arms over his head in panic. I didn't mean he began. In fact, calling for silence was a sufficiently rare event in the middle of a tavern brawl that silence was what Tom John got, and silence was what he filled. Howell started as he heard the boy's voice ring out, full of confidence and absolutely first-class projection. Brothers, and yet may I call all men brother, for on this night... The dwarf craned up to see Tom John standing on a chair, one hand raised in the prescribed declamatory fashion. Around him, men were frozen in the act of giving one another a right seeing to, their faces turned to his. Down at tabletop height, Howell's lips moved in perfect synchronization with the words as Tom John went through the familiar speech. He risked another look. The fighters straightened up, pulled themselves together adjusted the hang of their tunics, glanced apologetically at one another. Many of them were in fact standing to attention. Even Howell felt a fizz in his blood, and he'd written those words. He'd slaved half a night over them years ago, when Vitola had declared that they needed another five minutes in Act Three of The King of Ark. Scribblous! Something with a bit of spirit in it, he'd said. A bit of zip and sizzle, you know. Something to summon up the blood and put a bit of backbone in our friends in the hypnic seats. And just long enough to give us time to change the set. He'd been a bit ashamed of that day at the time. The famous Battle of Moorpork, he strongly suspected, had consisted of about 2,000 men lost in a swamp on a cold, wet day, hacking one another into oblivion with rusty swords. What would the last King of Ankh have said to a pack of ragged men who knew they were outnumbered, outflanked, and outgeneraled? Something with bite? Something with edge? Something like a drink of brandy to a dying man? No logic. No explanation. Just words that would reach right down through a tired man's brain and pull him to his feet by his testicles. Now he was seeing its effect. He began to think the walls had fallen away, and there was a cold mist blowing over the marshes, its choking silence broken only by the impatient cries of the carrion birds, and this voice. And he'd written the words. They were his. No half-crazed king had ever really spoken like this, and he'd written all this to fill in a gap so the castle made of painted sacking stretched over a frame could be shoved behind a curtain. And this voice was taking the coal dusts of his words and filling the room with diamonds. I made these words, Howell thought. They belong to me. They belong to him. 
look at those people. Not a patriotic thought among them, but if Tom John asked them, this bunch of drunkards would storm the patrician's palace tonight and they'd probably succeed. I just hope his mouth never falls into the wrong hands. As the last syllables died away, their white, hot echoes searing across every mind in the room, Howell shook himself and crawled out of hiding and jabbed Tom John on the knee. Come away now, you fool, he hissed, before it wears off. He grasped the boy firmly by the arm, handed a couple of complimentary tickets to the stunned barman, and hurried up the steps. He didn't stop until they were a street away. I thought I was doing rather well in there, said Tom John. A good deal too well, I reckon. The boy rubbed his hands together. Right, where shall we go next? Next? Tonight is young. No, tonight is dead. It's today that's young, said the dwarf hurriedly. Well, I'm not going home yet. Isn't somewhere a bit more friendly? We haven't actually drunk anything. Howell sighed. A trolls haven't, said Tom John. I've heard about them. There's some down in the shades. The shades is an ancient part of Ark Morpork, considered considerably more unpleasant and disreputable than the rest of the city. This always amazes visitors. I'd like to see a troll tavern. They're for trolls only, boy. Molten lava to drink and rock music and cheese and chutney-flavoured pebbles. What about dwarf bars? You'd hate it, said Howell fervently. Besides, you'd run out of headroom. Low dives, are they? Look at it like this. How long do you think you could sing about gold? It's yellow and it goes chink and you can buy things with it said Tom John experimentally as they strolled through the crowds on the plaza of broken moons. Four seconds, I think. Right. Five hours of it gets a bit repetitive. Howell kicked a pebble gloomily. He'd investigated a few dwarf bars last time they were in town and hadn't approved. For some reason, his fellow expatriates, who at home did nothing more objectionable than mine a bit of iron ore, and hunt small creatures, felt impelled, once in the big city, to wear chain-mail underwear, go around with axes in their belts, and call themselves names like Tim Kim Rumble Guts. And no one could beat a city dwarf when it came to quaffing. Sometimes they missed their mouths altogether. Anyway, he added, you'd get thrown out for being too creative. The actual words are gold, 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 gold. Is there a chorus? Gold, 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 gold. Gold, said Howell. You left out of gold there. I think it's because I wasn't cut out to be a dwarf. Cut down, lawn ornament, said Tom John. There was a little hiss of indrawn breath. Sorry, said Tom John hurriedly. It's just that father... I've known your father for a long time, said Howell. Through thick and thin, and there was a damn sight more thin than thick, since before you were bo He hesitated. Times were hard in those days, he mumbled. So what I'm saying is, well, some things you earn. Yes, I'm sorry. You see, just... Howell paused at the mouth of a dark alley. Did you hear something? He said. They squinted into the alley once again revealing themselves as newcomers to the city. More Porkians don't look down dark alleys when they hear strange noises. If they see four struggling figures, their first instinct is not to rush to anyone's assistance, or at least not to rush to the assistance of the one who appears to be losing and on the wrong end of someone else's boot. Nor do they shout, Oi! Above all, they don't look surprised when the assailant, instead of guiltily running off, flourish a small piece of cardboard in front of them. What's this? said Tom John. It's a clown, said Howell. They've mugged a clown. Theft license? said Tom John, holding the card up to the light. That's right, said the leader of the three. Only don't expect us to do you two, because we're on our way. That's right, said one of the assistants. 
It's the thingy, the quarter. But you were kicking him. Well, not a lot. Not what you'd call actual kicking. More foot nudging sort of thing, said the third thief. Fair's fair. He bloody well went and fetched Ron here a right thump, didn't he? Yeah, some people have no idea. Why, you heartless! Hal began, but Tom John laid a cautioning hand on his head. The boy turned the card over. The obverse read, J. H. Flannelfoot, Boggis and Nephews, Bespoke Thieves, The Old Firm, Established A. M. 1789. All type theft carried out professionally and with discretion. Houses cleared, 24 hour service, no job too small. Let us quote you for our family rate. It seems to be an order, he said reluctantly. Howell paused in the act of helping the dazed victim to his feet. In order, he shouted, to rub someone? We'll give him a chitty, of course, said Boggis. Lucky we found him first, really. Some of these newcomers in the business, they've got no idea. Cowboys, agreed a nephew. Ark Morpork's enviable system of licensed criminals owes much to the current patrician, Lord Vetinari. He reasoned that the only way to police a city of a million inhabitants was to recognize the various gangs and robbers' guilds, give them professional status, invite the leaders to large dinners, allow an acceptable level of street crime, and then make the guild leaders responsible for enforcing it on pain of being stripped of their new civic honours, along with large areas of their skin. It worked. Criminals, it turned out, made a very good police force. Unauthorised robbers soon found, for example, that instead of a night in the cells, they could now expect an eternity at the bottom of the river. However, there was the problem of apportioning the crime statistics. And so there arose a complex system of annual budgeting, chits and allowances to see that A, the members could make a reasonable living, and B, no citizen was robbed or assaulted more than an agreed number of times. Many foresighted citizens, in fact, arranged to get an acceptable minimum of theft, assault, etc., over at the beginning of the financial year, often in the privacy and comfort of their own homes, and thus be able to walk the streets quite safely for the rest of the year. It all ticked over extremely peacefully and efficiently, demonstrating once again that compared to the patrician of Arc, Machiavelli could not have run a whelk stall. How much did you steal? said Tom John. Boggis opened the clown's purse, which was stuck in his belt, then went pale. Oh, bleeding hell, he said. The nephews clustered around. We afford it, sort of thing. Second time this year, Uncle. Boggis glared at the victim. Well, how was I to know? I wasn't to know, was I? I mean, look at him. How much would you expect him to have on him? A couple of coppers, right? I mean, we'd never have done him. Only it was on our way home. You try to do someone a favour, this is what happens. How much has he got, then? said Tom John. There must be a hundred silver dollars in here, moaned Boggis, waving a purse. I mean, that's not my league. That's not my class. I can't handle that sort of money. You've got to be in the Guild of Lawyers or something to steal that much. It's way over my quota, is that? Give it back, then, said Tom John. But I'd done him a receipt. They've all got, you know, numbers on, explained the younger of the nephews. The Guild checks up, sort of. Howell grabbed Tom John's hand. Will you excuse us a moment? he said to the frantic thief, and dragged Tom John to the other side of the alley. OK, he said. Who's gone mad? Them? Me? You? Tom John explained. It's legal. Up to a certain point. Fascinating, isn't it? Man in the pub told me about it, sort of thing. But he's stolen too much. So it appears. I gather the guild is very strict about it. There was a groan from the victim hanging between them. He tinkled gently. Look after him, said Tom John. I'll sort this out. He went back to the thieves, 
who were looking very worried. My client feels, he said, that the situation could be resolved if you give the money back. Yes, said Boggis, approaching the idea as if it were a brand new theory of cosmic creation. But it's the receipt, see? We have to fill it up, time and place signed and everything. My client feels that possibly you could rob him of, let us say, five copper pieces, said Tom John smoothly. I bloody don't, shouted the fool who was coming round. That represents two copper pieces as the going rate, plus expenses of three copper pieces for time, call-out fees. We're in tear on Kosh, said Boggis. Exactly. Very fair, very fair. Boggis looked over Tom John's head at the fool, who was now completely conscious and very angry. Very fair, he said loudly. Statesmanlike, much obliged, I'm sure. He looked down at Tom John. And anything for yourself, sir? he added. Just say the word. We've got a special on GBH this season, practically painless. You'll barely fear a thing. Hardly breaks the skin, said the older nephew. Plus, you get a choice of limb. I believe I'm well served in that area, said Tom John smoothly. Oh, well. Right, yeah, then, no problem. Which merely leaves, continued Tom John, as the thieves started to walk away, the question of legal fees. The gentle greyness at the stump of the night flowed across Ark Moorpork. Tom John and Hal sat on either side of the table in their lodgings, counting. Three silver dollars and eighteen copper pieces in profit, I make it, said Tom John. That was amazing, said the fool. I mean, the way they volunteered to go home and get some more money as well, after you gave them that speech about the rights of man. He dabbed some more ointment on his head. And the youngest one started to cry, he added. Amazing! It wears off, said Hal. You're a dwarf, aren't you? Hal didn't feel he could deny this. I can tell you're a fool, he said. Yes, it's the bell, isn't it? said the fool wearily, rubbing his ribs. Yes, and the bells. Tom John grimaced and kicked Hal under the table. Well, I'm very grateful, said the fool. He stood up and winced. I'd really like to show my gratitude, he said. Is there a tavern open around here? Tom John joined him at the window and pointed down the length of the street. See all those tavern signs, he said. Yes, gosh, there's hundreds. Right, see the one at the end, with the blue and white sign? Yes, I think so. Well, as far as I know, that's the only one around here that's ever closed. Then pray allow me to treat you to a drink. It's the least I can do, said the fool nervously. And I'm sure the little fellow would like something to quaff. Howell gripped the edge of the table and opened his mouth to roar and stopped. He stared at the two figures. His mouth stayed open. It closed again with a snap. Something the matter, said Tom John. Howell looked away. It had been a long night. Trick of the light, he muttered. And I could do with a drink, he added. A bloody good quaff. In fact, he thought, why fight it? I'll even put up with the singing, he said. What was the next word? Scold, I think. Oh. Howell looked unsteadily into his mug. Drunkenness had this to be said for it. It stopped the flow of inspirations. And you left out the gold, he said. Where? <laughs> said Tom John. He was wearing the fool's hat. Howell considered this. I reckon, he said, concentrating, it was between the gold and the gold, and I reckon, again into the mug, it was empty, a horrifying sight. I reckon, 
He tried again and finally gave up and substituted. I reckon I can do with another drink. My shout this time, said the fool. <laughs> My squeak. <laughs> he tried to stand up and banged his head. In the gloom of the bar, a dozen axes were gripped more firmly. The part of Howell that was sober, and was horrified to see the rest of him being drunk, urged him to wave his hand at the beetling brows glaring at him through the gloom. It's all right, he said to the bar at large. He don't mean it. He's very funny, what's name? Idiot. Fool. Very funny fool. All the way from what's his life. Longer, said the fool, and sat down heavily on the bar. It's all right. Long way away from what's name. Sounds like a foot disease. Don't know how to behave. Don't know many dwarfs. <laughs> said the fool, clutching his head. Bit short of them where I come from. <laughs> Someone tapped Howell on the shoulder. He turned and looked into a craggy, hairy face under an iron helmet. The dwarf in question was tossing a throwing axe up and down in a meaningful way. You ought to tell your friend to be a bit less funny, he suggested. Otherwise he'll be amusing the demons in hell. Howell squinted at him through an alcoholic haze. How are you? he said. Grab pot thundergast, said the dwarf, striking his chainmail torso. And I say... Howell peered closer. Here yeah, I know you, he said. You've got a cosmetics mill down on Fast Street. I bought a lot of grease paint off you last week. A look of panic crossed Thundergust's face. He leaned forward in panic. Shut up! Shut up! he whispered. That's right, it said, the halls of Elvin Perfume and Rouge Co. said Howell happily. Very good stuff, said Tom John, who was trying to stop himself from sliding off a tiny bench. Especially your number 19. Corpse green. <laughs> My father swears it's the best. First class. The dwarf hefted his axe uneasily. Well, er, he said. Oh, but, yes, well, thank you. Only the finest ingredients, mark you. Chop them up with that, do you? Said Howell innocently, pointing to the axe. Or is it your night off? Thundergust's brow beetled again like a cockroach convention. Here, you're not with the theatre. There's us, said Tom John. Strolling players, he corrected himself. Standing still players now. <laughs> Sliding down players now. The dwarf dropped his axe and sat down on the bench, his face suddenly softened with enthusiasm. I went last week, he said. Bloody good it was. There was this girl and this fella, but she was married to this old man, and there was this other fella, and they said he died, and she pined away and took poison. And then it turned out this man was the other man, really, only he couldn't tell her on account of... Thundergust stopped and blew his nose. Everyone died in the end, he said. Very tragic. I cried all the way home. I don't mind telling you. She was so pale. Number 19 in the layer of powder, said Tom John cheerfully. Plus a bit of brown eyeshadow. Eh? And a couple of hankies in the vest, he added. What's he saying? said the dwarf to the company at, for want of a better word, large. Hal smiled into his tankard. Give him a bit of Gretelina, soliloquy boy, he said. Right. Tom John stood up, hit his head, sat down, and then knelt on the floor as a compromise. He clasped his hands to what would have been, but for a few chance chromosomes, his bosom. You lie, who call it summer, he began. 
The assembled dwarfs listened in silence for several minutes. One of them dropped his axe and was noisily hushed by the rest of them. And melting snow, farewell. Tom John finished. Drinks, foil, collapses behind battlements, down ladder, out of dress, into tablet for comic guard number two. Wait, entrance left. What? Ho! Good! That's about enough, said Howell quietly. Several of the dwarfs were crying into their helmets. There was a chorus of blown noses. Thundergust dabbed at his eye with a chainmail handkerchief. That was the most saddest thing I've ever heard, he said. He glared at Tom John. Hang on, he said. A realization dawned. He's a man. I bloody fell in love with that girl on stage. He nudged Howell. He's not a bit of an elf, is he? Absolutely human, said Hal. I know his father. Once again, he stared hard at the fool, who was watching them with his mouth open, and looked back at Tom John. <laughs> he thought. Coincidence. Acting, he said. A good actor can be anything, right? He could feel the fool's eye boring into the back of his short neck. Yes, but dressing up as women, it's a bit, said Thundergust doubtfully. Tom John slipped off his shoes and knelt down on them, bringing his face level with the dwarf's. He gave him a calculating stare for a few seconds, and then adjusted his features. And there were two Thundergusts. True, one of them was kneeling, and had apparently been shaved. What ho! What ho! said Tom John in the dwarf's voice. This was by way of being a hilarious gag to the rest of the dwarves, who had an uncomplicated sense of humour. As they gathered round the pair, Howell felt a gentle touch on the shoulder. You two are with the theatre, said the fool, now almost sober. That's right. Then I've come five hundred miles to find you. It was, as Howell would have noted in his stage directions, later the same day. The sound of hammering as the disc theatre rose from its cradle of scaffolding thumped through Howell's head and out the other side. He could remember the drinking, he was certain, and the dwarfs brought lots more rounds when Tom John did his impersonations. Then they had all gone to another bar, Thundergust knew, and then they had gone to a clutch and takeaway, and after that it was just a blur. He wasn't very good at quaffing. Too much of the drink actually landed in his mouth. Judging by the taste in it, some incontinent creature of the night had also scored a direct hit. Can you do it? said the toller. Howell smacked his lips to get rid of the taste. I expect, said Tom John. It sounded interesting, the way he told it. Wicked kings ruling with the help of evil witches, storms, ghastly forests, true heir to throne in life and death struggle, flash of dagger, screams, alarms. Evil King dies. Good triumphs. Bells ring out. Showers of rose petals can be arranged, said the toller. I know a man who can get them at practically cost. They both looked at Howell, who was drumming his fingers on his stool. All three found their attention drawn to the bag of silver the fool had given Howell. Even by itself, it represented enough money to complete the disc. And there had been talk of more to follow. Patronage, that was the thing. You will do it then, will you? said Vitola. It's got a certain something, Howell conceded. Ah, uh, I don't know. I'm not trying to pressure you, said Vitola. All three pairs of eyes swiveled back to the money bag. It seems a bit fishy. Tom John conceded. I mean, the fool is decent enough, but the way he tells it, it's very odd. His mouth says the words, and his eyes say something else. And I got the impression he'd much rather we believed his eyes. On the other hand, said the toller, what harm could it do? The pay's the thing. Howell raised his head. 
What? He said, muzzily. I said, the play's the thing, said the toller. There was silence again, except for the drumming of Howell's fingertips. The bag of silver seemed to have grown larger. In fact, it seemed to fill the room. The thing is, the toller began unnecessarily loudly. The way I see it, Howell began. They both stopped. After you, sorry. It wasn't important. Go ahead. I was going to say, we could afford to build a disc anyway, said Howell. Just the shell and the stage, said Vitola. But not all the other things. Not the trapdoor mechanism, or the machine for lowering gods out of heaven, or the big turntable, or the wind fans. We used to manage without all that stuff, said Howell. Remember the old days? All we had was a few planks and a bit of painted sacking. But we had a lot of spirit. If we wanted wind, we had to make it ourselves. He drummed his fingers for a while. Of course, he added quietly. We should be able to afford a wave machine. A small one. I've got this idea about this ship wrecked on an island. Where there is this... Sorry. Vitola shook his head. But we've had some huge audiences, said Tom John. Sure, lad, sure. But they pay in hapenies. The artificers want silver. If we wanted to be rich men, people... He corrected hurriedly. We should have been born carpenters. Vitola shifted uneasily. I already owe Christopher Ray's the troll more than I should. The other two stared. He's the one that has people's limbs torn off, said Tom John. How much do you owe him? said Howell. It's all right, said Vitola hurriedly. I'm keeping up the interest payments, more or less. Yes, but how much does he want? An arm and a leg. The dwarf and the boy stared at him in horror. How could you have been so... I did it for you two. Tom John deserves a better stage. He doesn't want to go ruining his health, sleeping in lattice and never knowing a home. And you, my man, you need somewhere settled, with all the proper things you ought to have, like trapdoors and wave machines and so forth. You talked me into it, and I thought, they're right. It's no life on the road, giving two performances a day to a bunch of farmers and going round with a hat afterwards. What sort of future is that? I thought, we've got to get a place somewhere, with comfortable seats for the gentry, people who don't throw potatoes at the stage. I said, blow the cost. I just wanted you to... All right, all right, said Howell. I'll write it. I liked it, said Tom John. I'm not forcing you, mind, said Vitola. It's your own choice. Howell frowned at the table. There were, he had to admit, some nice touches. Three witches was good. Two wouldn't be enough. Four would be too many. They could be meddling with the destinies of mankind and everything. Lots of smoke and green light. You could do a lot with three witches. It was surprising no one had thought of it before. So we can tell this fool that we'll do it, can we? said Vitola, his hand on the bag of silver. And of course you couldn't go wrong with a good storm. And there was the ghost routine that Vitola had cut out of please yourself, saying that they couldn't afford the muslin. And perhaps he could put death in, too. Young Daffy would make a damn good death, with white makeup and platform soles. How far away did he say he'd come from? he said. The Ram Tops, said the playmaster. Some little kingdom no one's ever heard of sounds like a chest infection. It'd take months to get there. I'd like to go anyway, said Tom John. That's where I was born. Vitola looked at the ceiling. Howell looked at the floor. Anything was better just at that moment than looking at each other's face. That's what you said, said the boy. When you did a tour of the mountains, you said. Yes, but I can't remember where, said Vitola. 
All those little mountain towns look the same to me. We spent more time pushing the latte across rivers and dragging them up hills than we ever did on the stage. I could take some of the younger lads, and we could make a summer of it, said Tom John. Put on all the old favourites. And we could still be back by Soul Cake Day. You could stay here and see to the theatre, and we could be back for a grand opening. He grinned at his father. It'd be good for them, he said slyly. You always said some of the young lads don't know what a real acting life is like. Howell's still got to write the play, Batola pointed out. Howell was silent. He was staring at nothing at all. After a while, one hand fumbled in his doublet and brought out a sheaf of paper, and then disappeared in the direction of his belt and produced the small corked ink pot and a bundle of quills. They watched as, without once looking at them, the dwarf smoothed out the paper, opened the ink pot, dipped a quill, held it poised like a hawk waiting for its prey, and then began to write. Vitola nodded at Tom John. Walking as quietly as they could, they left the room. Around mid-afternoon they took up a tray of food and a bundle of paper. The tray was still there at tea time. The paper had gone. A few hours later, a passing member of the company reported hearing a yell of, It can't work! It's back to front! and the sound of something being thrown across the room. Around supper, Fatola heard a shouted request for more candles and fresh quills. Tom John tried to get an early night, but sleep was murdered by the sound of creativity from the next room. There were mutterings about balconies, and whether the world really needed wave machines. The rest was silent, except for the insistent scratching of quills. Eventually, Tom John dreamed. Now, have we got everything this time? Yes, Granny. Like the fire, McGrat? Yes, Granny. Right. Let's see now. I wrote it all down, Granny. I can read, my girl, thank you very much. Now, what's this? Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw. What are these supposed to be? Oh, Jason slaughtered a pig yesterday, isn't he? These look like perfectly good chitterlings to me, Geither. There's a couple of decent meals in them, if I'm any judge. Please, Granny. There's plenty of starving people in Clatch who wouldn't turn up their nose at them, that's all I'm saying. All right, all right. Whole grain wheat and lentils, too, in the cauldron seethe and stew. What happened to the toad? Please, Granny, you're slowing it down. You know Goody was against all unnecessary cruelty. Vegetable protein is a perfectly acceptable substitute. That means no newt or fenny snake either, I suppose. No, Granny. Or tiger's children? Here. What the hell's this? Excuse my catching. It's a tiger's children. Our Wayne bought it off a merchant from foreign parts. You sure? Oh, Wayne, oh, special, Esme. Looks like any other children to me. Oh, well. Double hubbles, double trouble, fire burn and cauldron bu Why isn't the cauldron bubbling, McGrath? Tom John awoke, shivering. The room was dark. Outside, a few stars pierced the mist of the city, and there was the occasional whistle of burglars and footpads as they went about their strictly lawful occasions. There was silence from the next room, but he could see the light of a candle under the door. He went back to bed. Across the turgid river, the fool had also awakened. He was staying at the Fool's Guild, not out of choice, but because the Duke hadn't given him any money for anything else, and getting to sleep had been difficult in any case. The chilly walls had brought back too many memories. Besides, if he listened hard, he could hear the muted sobs and occasional whimpers from the students' dormitories as they contemplated with horror the life that lay ahead of them. He punched the rock-hard pillow and sank into a fitful sleep, a chance to dream. Slab and grew, yes. But it doesn't say how slab and 
Goody Wemper recommended testing a bit in a cup of cold water like toffee. How inconvenient that we didn't think to bring one, Magrat. I think we should be getting on, Esme. The night's nearly gone. Just don't blame me if it doesn't work properly, that's all. Let's see. Baboon hair and... Who's got the baboon hair? Oh, thank you, Geiter. That looks more like cat hair to me, but never mind. Baboon hair and mandrake root. And if that's real mandrake, I'm very surprised. Carrot juice and tongue of boot. I see. Little humour, I suppose. Please hurry. All right, all right. Owl hoot and glowworm glimmer. Boil and then allow to simmer. You know, Esme, this doesn't taste half bad. You're not supposed to drink it, you daft oyen. Tom John sat bolt upright in bed. That was them again. The same faces, the bickering voices, distorted by time and space. Even after he looked out of the window, where fresh daylight was streaming through the city, he could still hear the voices grumbling into the distance, like old thunder fading away. I, for one, didn't believe it about the tongue of boot. It's still very runny. Do you think we should put some corn flour in it? It won't matter. Either he's on his way or he isn't. He got up and doused his face in the wash basin. Silence rolled in swathes from Howell's room. Tom John slipped on his clothes and pushed open the door. It looked as though it had snowed indoors, great heavy flakes that had drifted into odd corners of the room. Howell sat at his low table in the middle of the floor, his head pillowed on a pile of paper, snoring. Tom John tiptoed across the room and piled up a discarded ball of paper at random. He smoothed it out and read, King, now I am just going to put the crown on this bush here. And you will tell me if anyone tries to take it, won't you? Groundlings. Yes! King. Now, if I could just find my horsey. First assassin pops up behind rock. Audience. Behind you! First assassin disappears. King. You're trying to play tricks on old Kingy, you naughty. There was a lot of crossing out and a large blot. Tom John threw it aside and selected another ball at random. King, is this a... duck, knife, dagger, I see, behind, beside, in front of, before me? It's... beak, handle, pointing at me... my hand? First murderer. Oh, no, it isn't. If faith... It is not so. Second murderer. Oh, yes, it is. Thou speakest true, sir. Judging by the creases in the paper, this one had been thrown at the wall particularly hard. Howell had once explained to Tom John his theory about inspirations, and by the look of it, a whole shower had fallen last night. Fascinated by this insight into the creative processes, however, Tom John tried a third discarded attempt. Queen. Faith, there is a sound without. Mayhap it is my husband returning. Quick, into the guardy robe, and wait not upon the order of your going. Murderer. Marry, but your maid still has my pantoufle. Maid, opening door. The Archbishop, Your Majesty. Priest, under bed. Bless my soul. Divers' alarms. Tom John wondered vaguely what divers' alarms, which Howell always included somewhere in the stage directions, actually were. Howell always refused to say. Perhaps they referred to dangerous depths, or lack of air pressure. He sidled towards the table and with great care pulled the sheaf of paper from under the sleeping dwarf's head, lowering it gently onto a cushion. The top sheet read, Provence, Helmet, Small Gods, Eve, A Knight of Knives, Daggers, Kings by Howell of Vitala's Men.
a comedy tragedy in eight, five, six, three, nine acts. Characters: Thelmond, a good king; Verence, a bad king; Worthy Wax, an evil witch; Hog, and likewise evil witch; Margaret, and Siren. Tom flipped over the page. Scene: A、uh, drawing room, ship at sea, street in Pseudopolis. Blasted Moor. Enter three witches. The boy read for a while and then turned to the last page. Gentles, leave us, dance and sing, and wish good health unto the king. Exeunt all, singing fa la la, etc. Shower of rose petals. Ringing of bells, gods descend from heaven, demons rise from hell. Much ado with the turntable, etc. The end. Howell snored. In his dreams, gods rose and fell, ships moved with cunning and art across canvas oceans, pictures jumped and ran together and became flickering images. Men flew on wires, flew without wires. Great ships of illusion fought against one another in imaginary skies. Seas opened. Ladies were sawn in half. A thousand special effects men giggled and gibbered. Through it all, he ran with his arms open in desperation, knowing that none of this really existed, or ever would exist, and all he really had was a few square yards of planking, some canvas, and some paint on which to trap the beckoning images that invaded his head. Only in our dreams are we free. The rest of the time, we need wages. It's a good play," said Vitola. "Apart from the ghost." "The ghost stays," said Howell sullenly. "But people always jeer and throw things. Anyway, you know how hard it is to get all the chalk dust out of the clothes." "The ghost stays. It's a dramatic necessity." You said it was a dramatic necessity in the last play. When、well, it was, and in Please Yourself, and in A Wizard of Ankh, and all the rest of them. I like ghosts. They stood to one side and watched the dwarf artificers assembling the wave machine. It consisted of half a dozen long spindles covered in complex canvas spirals. Painted in shades of blue and green and white, and stretching the complete width of the stage, an arrangement of cogs and endless belts led to a treadmill in the wings. When the spirals were all turning at once, people with weak stomachs had to look away. Sea battles, breathed Hal. Shipwrecks, tritons, pirates, squeaky bearings, laddie, groaned Vitola. Shifting his weight on his stick, maintenance expenses over time. It does look extremely intricate, Hal admitted. Who designed it? A daft old chap in the street of cunning artificers, said the taller. Leonard of Quam. He's a painter, really. He just does this sort of thing for a hobby. I happened to hear that he's been working on this for months. I just snapped it up quick when he couldn't get it to fly. They watched the mock waves turn. You're bent on going," said the taller at last. "Yes, Tom John's still a bit wild. He needs an older head around the place." "Oh, Miss You, Laddie, I don't mind telling you, you've been like a son to me." How old are you exactly? I never did know. Hundred and two. Vitola nodded gloomily. He was sixty, and his arthritis was playing him up. You've been like a father to me, then," he said. It evens out in the end," said Howell diffidently. Half the height, twice the age. You could say that, on the overall average, we live about the same length of time as humans. The playmaster sighed. Well, I don't know what I will do without you and Tom John around, and that's a fact. It's only for the summer. 
and a lot of the lads are staying. In fact, it's mainly the apprentices that are going, and you said yourself it'd be good experience. Vitola looked wretched, and in the chilly air of the half-finished theatre, a good deal smaller than usual, like a balloon two weeks after the party. He prodded some wood shavings distractedly with his stick. We grow old, Master Howell. At least, he corrected himself, I grow old, and you grow older. We have heard the gongs at midnight. Aye, you don't want it to go, do you? I was all for it at first, you know. Then I thought, there's destiny afoot. Just when things are going well, there's always bloody destiny. I mean, that's where he came from. Somewhere up in the mountains. Now fate is calling him back. I shan't see him again. Sorry for the summer. Vitola held up a hand. Don't interrupt. It got the right dramatic flow there. Sorry. Flick, flick, went the stick on the wood shavings, knocking them into the air. I mean, you know he's not my flesh and blood. He's your son, though, said Howell. This hereditary business isn't all it's cracked up to me. It's fine of you to say that. I mean it. Look at me. I wasn't supposed to be writing plays. Dwarfs aren't even supposed to be able to read. I shouldn't worry too much about destiny if I was you. I was destined to be a miner. Destiny gets it wrong half the time. But you said he looks like the fool person. I can't see it myself, mark you. The light's got to be right. Could be some destiny at work there. Howell shrugged. Destiny was funny stuff, he knew. You couldn't trust it. Often you couldn't even see it. Just when you knew you had it cornered, it turned out to be something else. Coincidence, maybe, or providence. You barred the door against it, and it was standing behind you. Then just when you thought you had it nailed down, it walked away with a hammer. He used destiny a lot. As a tool for his plays, it was even better than a ghost. There was nothing like a bit of destiny to get the old plot rolling, but it was a mistake to think you could spot the shape of it, and as for thinking it could be controlled. Granny Weatherwax squinted irritably into Nanny Og's crystal ball. It wasn't a particularly good one. Being a greenish glass fishing float brought back from fawn seaside parts by one of her sons, it distorted everything, including, she suspected, the truth. He's definitely on his way, she said at last, in a cart. A furry white charger would have been favourite, said Nanny Og. You know, caparisoned and that. Has he got a magic sword? said McGrath, craning to see. Granny Weatherwax sat back. You're a disgrace, the pair of you, she said. I don't know. Magic chargers, fiery swords, ogling away like a couple of milkmaids. A magic sword is important, said McGrath. You've got to have one. We could make him one, she added wistfully, out of thunderbolt iron. I've got a spell for that. You take some thunderbolt iron, she said uncertainly, and then you make a sword out of it. I can't be having with that old stuff said Granny. You can wait days for the damn things to hit, and then they nearly take your arm off. And a strawberry birthmark, said Nanny Og, ignoring the interruption. The other two looked at her expectantly. A strawberry birthmark, she repeated. It's one of those things you've got to have if you're a prince coming to claim your kingdom. That's so everyone will know, of course. I don't know how they know it's strawberry. Can't abide strawberries, said Granny vaguely, quizzing the crystal again. In its cracked green depths, smelling of bygone lobsters, a minute Tom John kissed his parents, shook hands or hugged the rest of the company, and climbed aboard the leading latte. It must have worked, she told herself. Else he wouldn't be coming here, would he? 
or others must be his trusty band of good companions. After all, common sense. He's got to come five hundred miles across difficult country. Anything could happen. I dare say the armour and swords is in the cart. She detected a twinge of doubt and set out to quell it instantly. There isn't any other reason for him to come. Stands to reason. We got the spell exactly right. Except for the ingredients. And most of the poetry. And it probably wasn't the right time. And Gaither took most of it home for the cat. Which couldn't have been proper. But he's on his way. What can't speak can't lie. Best put the cloth over it when you've done, Esme, said Nanny. I always get worried someone will peer in at me when I'm having my bath. He's on his way, said Granny, the satisfaction in her voice so strong you could have ground corn with it. She dropped the black velvet bag over the ball. It's a long road, said Nanny. As many as slip twixt dress and drawers, a could be bandits. We shall watch over him, said Granny. That's not right. If he's going to be king, he ought to be able to fight his own battles, said Magrat. We don't want him to go wasting his strength, said Nanny primly. We want him good and fresh for when he gets here. And then, I hope, we shall leave him to fight his battles in his own way, said Magrat. Granny clapped her hands together in a businesslike fashion. Quite right, she said, provided he looks like winning. They had been meeting at Nanny Ogg's cottage. Magrat made an excuse to tarry after Granny left, around dawn, allegedly to help Nanny with tidying up. Whatever happened to not meddling? she said. What do you mean? You know, Nanny. It's not proper meddling, said Nanny awkwardly. Just helping matters along. Surely you can't really think that. Nanny sat down and fidgeted with a cushion. Well, see, all this non-meddling business is fine in the normal course of things she said. Not meddling is easy when you don't have to. And then I've got the family to think about. Oh, Jason's been in a couple of fights because of what people have been saying. Oh, Sean was thrown out of the army. The way I see it, when we get the new king in, he should owe us a few favours. It's only fair. But only last week you were saying... Magrat stopped shocked at this display of pragmatism. A week's a long time in magic, said Nanny. Fifteen years, for one thing. Anyway, Esme is determined and I'm in no mood to stop her. So what you're saying, said Magrat icily, is that this not meddling thing is like taking a vow not to swim. You'll absolutely never break it, Unless, of course, you happen to find yourself in the water. Better than drowning, said Nanny. She reached up to the mantelpiece and took down a clay pipe that was like a small tar pit. She lit it with a spill from the remains of the fire, while Grebo watched her carefully from his cushion. Magrat idly lifted the hood from the ball and glared at it. I think, she said, that I will never really understand about witchcraft. Just when I think I've got a grip on it, changes. We're all just people. Nanny blew a cloud of blue smoke at the chimney. Everyone's just people. Can I borrow the crystal? said Magrat suddenly. Feel free, said Nanny. She grinned at Magrat's back. Had a row with your young man, she said. I really don't know what you're talking about. I haven't seen him around for weeks. Oh, the Duke sent him to... Magrat stopped and went on. Sent him away for something or other. Not that it bothers me at all, either way. So I see. Take the ball by all means. Magrat was glad to get...
No one was about on the moors at night anyway, but over the last couple of months, things had definitely been getting worse. On top of the general suspicion of witches, it was dawning on the few people in Lancre who had any dealings with the outside world that, A, either more things had been happening than they had heard about before, or, B, time was out of joint. It wasn't easy to prove. Because of the way time was recorded among the various states, kingdoms, and cities. After all, when over an area of a hundred square miles the same year is variously the year of the small bat, the anticipated monkey, the hunting cloud, fat cows, three bright stallions, and at least nine numbers recording the time since the calendar of the theocracy of Muntab counts down, not up. No one knows why, but it might not be a good idea to hang around to find out. Assorted kings, prophets, and strange events were either crowned, born, or happened, and each year has a different number of months, and some of them don't have weeks, and one of them refuses to accept the day as a measure of time. The only thing it is possible to be sure of is that good sex doesn't last long enough, except for the Zamingo tribe of the Great Neff, of course. But the few traders who came along the mountain tracks after the winter seem to be rather older than they should have been. Unexplained happenings are always more or less expected in the Ramtops because of the high magical potential, but several years disappearing overnight was a bit of a first. She locked the door, fastened the shutters, and carefully laid the green glass globe on the kitchen table. She concentrated. The fool dozed under the tarpaulins of a river barge, heading up the Ankh at a steady two miles an hour. It wasn't an exciting method of transport, but it got you there eventually. He looked safe enough, but he was tossing and turning in his sleep. The Grat wondered what it was like spending your whole life doing something you didn't want to. Like being dead, she considered. Only worse, the reason being you were alive to suffer it. She considered the fool to be weak, badly led, and sorely in need of some backbone and she was longing for him to get back, so she could look forward to never seeing him again. It was a long, hot summer. They didn't rush things. There was a lot of country between Ankh Moorpork and the Ram Tops. It was, Howell had to admit, fun. It wasn't a word dwarfs were generally at home with. Please yourself went over well. It always did. The apprentices excelled themselves. They forgot lines and played jokes. In Stolat, the whole third act of Gretelina and Malaeus was performed against the backdrop for the second act of the Mage Wars. No one seemed to notice that the greatest love scene in history was played on a set depicting a tidal wave sweeping across a continent. That was possibly because Tom John was playing Gretelina. The effect was so disconcertingly riveting that Howell made him swap roles for the next house if you could apply the term to a barn hired for the day. And the effect still had more rivets than a suit of plate armour, including the helmet. And even though Gretelina, in this case, was now young Wimslow, who was a bit simple and tended to stutter, and whose spots might eventually clear up. The following day, in some nameless village in the middle of an endless sea of cabbages, he let Tom John play Old Miskin in Please Yourself, a role that Vitola had always excelled in. You couldn't let anyone play it who was under the age of forty, not unless you wanted an old miskin with a cushion up his jerkin and grease paint wrinkles. Howell didn't consider himself old. His father had still been digging three tons of ore a day at the age of two hundred. Now he felt old. He watched Tom John hobble off the stage, and for a fleeting instant knew what it was to be a fat old man, pickled in wine, fighting old wars that no one cared about any more, hanging grimly onto the precipice of late middle age for fear of dropping off into antiquity, but only with one hand, because with the other he was raising two fingers at death. Of course he'd known that when he wrote the part, but he hadn't known it. The same magic didn't seem to infuse the new play, they tried it a few times just to see how it went. The audience watched attentively and went home. Didn't bother to throw anything. 
It wasn't that they thought it was bad. They didn't think it was anything. But all the right ingredients were there, weren't they? Tradition was full of people giving evil rulers a well-justified seeing to. Witches were always a draw. The apparition of death was particularly good, and some lovely lines. Mix them all together, and they seemed to cancel out, become a mere humdrum way of filling the stage for a couple of hours. Late at night, when the cast was asleep, Howell would sit up in one of the carts and feverishly rewrite. He rearranged scenes, cut lines, added lines, introduced a clown, included another fight, and tuned up the special effects. Didn't seem to have any effect. The play was like some marvellous, intricate painting, a feast of impressions close to, a mere blur from a distance. When the inspirations were sleeting fast, he even tried changing the style. In the morning, the early risers grew accustomed to finding discarded experiments decorating the grass around the carts, like extremely literate mushrooms. Tom John kept one of the strangest. First which, he's late. Pause. Second which, he said he would come. Pause. Third which, he said he would come, but he hasn't. This is my last newt. I saved it for him, and he hasn't come. Pause. I think, said Tom John later, you ought to slow down a bit. You've done what was ordered. No one said it had to sparkle. It could, you know. If I could just get it right. You're absolutely sure about the ghost, are you? Said Tom John. The way he threw the line away made it clear he wasn't. There's nothing wrong with the ghost, snapped Howell. The scene with the ghost is the best I've done. I was just wondering if this is the right play for it, that's all. The ghost stays. Now let's get on, boy. Two days later, with the ram tops a blue and white wall that was beginning to dominate the hubwood horizon, the company was attacked. There wasn't much drama. They had just manhandled the lattes across a ford and were resting in the shade of a grove of trees which suddenly fruited robbers. Howell looked along the line of half a dozen stained and rusty blades. Their owners seemed slightly uncertain about what to do next. We've got a receipt somewhere, he began. Tom John nudged him. These don't look like guild thieves, he hissed. They definitely look freelance to me. It would be nice to say that the leader of the robbers was a black-bearded, swaggering brute, with a red headscarf and one gold earring and a chin you could clean pots with. Actually, it would be practically compulsory. And, in fact, this was so. Howell thought the wooden leg was overdoing it, but the man had obviously studied the role. Well, now, said the bandit chief, what have we here, and do you have any money? We're actors said Tom John. That ought to answer both questions, said Howell. And none of your repartee, said the bandit. I've been to the city, I have. I know repartee when I see it, and... He half turned to his followers, raising an eyebrow to indicate that the next remark was going to be witty. If you're not careful, I can make a few cutting remarks of my own. There was dead silence behind him until he made an impatient gesture with his cutlass. All right, he said, against a chorus of uncertain laughter. We'll just take any loose change, valuables, food and clothing you might be having. Could I say something? said Tom John. The company backed away from him. Howell smiled at his own feet. You're going to beg for mercy, are you? said the bandit. That's right. Howell thrust his hands deep into his pocket and looked up at the sky, whistling under his breath and trying not to break into a maniac grin. He was aware that the other actors were also looking expectantly at Tom John. He's going to give them the mercy speech from the troll's tail, he thought. The point I'd just like to make is that, said Tom John, and his stance changed subtly. His voice became deeper, his right hand flung out dramatically. The worth of man lies not in feats of arms, or the fiery hunger, or the ravening, 
It's going to be like when that man tried to rob us back in Stolat, Howell thought. If they end up giving us their swords, what the hell are we going to do with them? And it's so embarrassing when they start crying. It was at this moment that the world around him took a green tint, and he thought he could make out, right on the cusp of hearing, other voices. There's men with swords, Granny! Rend with glowing blades, the marvel of the world, Tom John said. And the voices at the edge of imagination said, No king of mine is going to beg anything off anyone. Give me that milk jug, McGrath. The heart of compassion, the kiss. That was a present from my aunt. This jewel of jewels, this crown of crowns. There was silence. One or two of the bandits were weeping silently into their hands. Their chief said, Is that it? For the first time in his life, Tom John looked nonplussed. Well, yes, he said. Er, uh, would you like me to repeat it? Oh, that was a good speech, the bandit conceded. But I don't see what it's got to do with me. I'm a practical man. Hand over your valuables. His sword came up until it was level with Tom John's throat. And all the rest of you shouldn't be standing there like idiots, he added. Come on, or the boy gets it. Winslow, the apprentice, raised a cautious hand. What? said the bandit. Uh, are you sure you listen carefully, sir? I won't tell you again. Either I hear the clink of coins... Or you hear a gurgle. In fact, what they all heard was a whistling noise high in the air and the crash as a milk jug, its sides frosted with the ice of altitude, dropped out of the sky onto the spike atop of the chief's helmet. The remaining bandits took one look at the results and fled. The actors stared down at the recumbent bandit. Howell prodded a lump of frozen milk with his boot. Well, well, he said weakly. He didn't take any notice, whispered Tom John. A born critic, said the dwarf. It was a blue and white jug. Funny how little details stood out at a time like this. It had been smashed several times in the past, he could see, because the pieces had been carefully glued together again. Someone had really loved that jug. What we're dealing with here he said, rallying some shreds of logic. Is a freak whirlwind, obviously. But milk jugs don't just drop out of the sky, said Tom John, demonstrating the astonishing human art of denying the obvious. I don't know about that. I've heard of fish and frogs and rocks, said Howell. There's nothing against crockery. He began to rally. It's just one of these uncommon phenomena. They happen all the time in this part of the world. There's nothing unusual about it. They got back onto the carts and rode on in unaccustomed silence. Young Winslow collected every bit of jug he could find and stored them carefully in the props box and spent the rest of the day watching the sky, hoping for a sugar basin. The lattes toiled up the dusty slopes of the ram tops, mere motes in the foggy glass of the crystal. Are they all right? said McGrath. They're wandering all over the place, said Granny. They might be good at acting, but they've got something to learn about the travelling. It was a nice jug, said McGrath. You can't get them like that any more. I mean, if you'd said what was on your mind, there was a flat iron on the shelf. There's more to life than milk jugs. It had a daisy pattern round the top. Granny ignored her. I think, she said. It's time we had a look at this new king. Close up. <laughs> she cackled. You cackled, Granny, said McGrath darkly. I did not. It was... Granny fumbled for a word. A chuckle. I bet Black Alice used to cackle. You want to watch out. You don't end up the same. She did, said Nanny, from her seat by the fire. 
She went a bit funny at the finish, you know. Poisoned apples and such like. Just because I might have chuckled a, a bit roughly, sniffed Granny. She felt she was being unduly defensive. Anyway, there's nothing wrong with cackling. In moderation. I think, said Tom John, that we're lost. Howell looked at the baking purple moorland around them, which stretched up to the towering spires of the ram tops themselves. Even in the height of summer, there were pennants of snow flying from the highest peaks. It was a landscape of describable beauty. Bees were busy, or at least endeavouring to look and sound busy, in the time by the trackside. Cloud shadows flickered over the alpine meadows. There was the kind of big, empty silence made by an environment that not only doesn't have people in it, but doesn't need them either. Or signposts. We were lost ten miles ago, said Hal. There's got to be a new word for what we are now. You said the mountains were honeycombed with dwarf mines, said Tom John. You said a dwarf could tell wherever he was in the mountains. Underground, I said. It's all a matter of strata and rock formations, not on the surface. All the landscape gets in the way. We could dig your hole, said Tom John. But it was a nice day, and as the road meandered through clumps of hemlock and pine, outposts of the forest, it was pleasant enough to let the mules go at their own pace. The road, Howell felt, had to go somewhere. This geographical fiction had been the death of many people. Roads don't necessarily have to go anywhere. They just have to have somewhere to start. We are lost, aren't we? said Tom John after a while. Certainly not. Where are we then? The mountains, perfectly clear on any atlas. We ought to stop and ask someone. Tom John gazed around at the rolling countryside. Somewhere a lonely curlew howled, or possibly it was a badger. Hull was a little lazy about rural matters, at least those that took place higher than about the limestone layer. There wasn't another human being within miles. Who did you have in mind? He said sarcastically. That old woman in the funny hat? said Tom John. Pointing. I've been watching her. She keeps ducking behind a bush when she thinks I've seen her. Howell turned and looked at the bramble bush, which wobbled. Oh, there, good mother, he said. The bush sprouted an indignant head. Whose mother? it said. Howell hesitated. Just a figure of speech, Mrs. Miss. Mistress, snapped Granny Weatherwax. And I'm a poor old woman gathering wood, she added defiantly. She cleared her throat. <coughs> Lorks, she went on. You did give me a fright, young master. My poor old heart. There was silence from the cart. Then Tom John said, I'm sorry. What? said Granny. Your poor old heart what? What about my poor old heart? said Granny, who wasn't used to acting like an old woman and had a very limited repertoire in this area. But it's traditional that young heirs seeking their destiny get help from mysterious old women gathering wood, and she wasn't about to buck tradition. It's just you mentioned it, said Howell. Well, it isn't important. Lorks. I expect you're looking for Lonkra, said Granny testily, in a hurry to get to the point. Well, yes, said Tom John, all day. You come too far, said Granny. Go back about two miles and take the track on the right, past the stand of pines. Wimslow tugged at Tom John's shirt. When you m meet a my mysterious old lady on the road, he said, you've got to offer her a sh share of your lunch or help her across the r river. You have? It's terribly b b bad luck not to. Tom John gave Granny a polite smile. Do you care to share our lunch, good ma- Oh, Mom? 
Granny looked doubtful. What is it? Salt pork? She shook her head. Thanks all the same, she said graciously, but it gives me wind. She turned on her heel and set off through the bushes. We could help you across the river if you like, shouted Tom John after her. What river? said Hull. We're on the moor. There can't be a river in miles. You've got to get them on your, your side, said Winslow. Then they help you. Perhaps we should have asked her to wait while we went and looked for one, said Howell sourly. They found the turning. It led to a forest crisscrossed with as many tracks as a marshalling yard. The sort of forest where the back of your head tells you the trees are turning around to watch you as you go past, and the sky seems to be very high up and a long way off. Despite the heat of the day, a dank, impenetrable gloom hovered among the tree trunks which crowded up to the track, as if intending to obliterate it completely. They were soon lost again, and decided that being lost somewhere where you didn't know where you were was even worse than being lost in the open. She could have given more explicit instructions, said Howell. Like, ask at the next crone, said Tom John. Look over there. He stood up in the seat. Oh, there, oh, good... He hazarded. McGrath pushed back her shawl. Just a humble wood gatherer, she snapped. She held up a twig for proof. Several hours waiting with nothing but trees to talk to hadn't improved her temper. Winslow nudged Tom John, who nodded and fixed his face in an ingratiating smile. Would you care to share our lunch, oh, good w miss? he said. It's only salt pork, I'm afraid. Meat is extremely bad for the digestive system, said McGrath. If you could see inside your colon, you'd be horrified. I think I would, muttered Howell. Did you know that an adult male carries up to five pounds of undigested red meat in his intestines at all times, said McGrath, whose informative lectures on nutrition had been known to cause whole families to hide in the cellar until she went away? whereas pine kernels and sunflower seeds. There aren't any rivers around here that you need helping over, are there? said Tom John desperately. Don't be silly, said McGrath. I'm just a humble wood gatherer, Lorks, collecting a few sticks and mayhap directing lost travellers on the road to Lancre. Ah, said Hal. I thought we'd get to that. You fork? Left up ahead and turn right at the big stone with the crack in it. You can't miss it, said McGrath. Fine, growled Howell. Well, we won't keep you. I'm sure you've got a lot of wood to collect and so forth. He whistled the mules into a plod again, grumbling to himself. When, an hour later, the track ran out among a landscape of house-sized boulders, Howell laid down the reins carefully and folded his arms. Tom John stared at him. What do you think you're doing? he said. Waiting, said the dwarf grimly. It'll be getting dark soon. We won't be here long, said Howell. Eventually, Nanny Og gave up and came out from behind her rock. It's salt pork, understand, said Howell sharply. Take it or leave it, OK? Now, which way's Lonker up? Keep on left at the ravine, then you pick up the track that leads to a bridge. You can't miss it, said Nanny promptly. Howell grabbed the reins. You forgot about the locks. Packer, <coughs> sorry, locks. And you're a humble old wood gatherer, I expect, Howell went on. Spot on, lad, said Nanny cheerfully. Just about to make a start, as a matter of fact. Tom John nudged the dwarf. You forgot about the river, he said. Howell glared at him. Oh, yes, he muttered. And you can wait here while we go and find a river. To help you across, said Tom John carefully. Nanny Og gave him a bright smile. There's a perfectly good bridge, she said. But I wouldn't say no to a lift. Move over. 
To Howell's irritation, Nanny Og hitched up her skirts and scrambled onto the board, inserting herself between Tom John and the dwarf, and then twisting like an oyster knife until she occupied half the seat. You mentioned salt pork, she said. There wouldn't be any mustard, would there? No, said Howell sullenly. Can't abide salt pork without condiments, said Nanny conversationally. But pass it over anyway. Wimslow wordlessly handed over the basket holding the troop's supper. Nanny lifted the lid and gave it a critical assessment. That cheese in there's a bit off, she said. Needs eating up quick. What's in the leather bottle? Beer, said Tom John, a fraction of a second before Howell had the presence of mind to say, Walter. Pretty weak stuff, said Nanny eventually. She fumbled in her apron pocket for her tobacco pouch. Has anyone got a light? she inquired. A couple of actors produced bundles of matches. Nanny nodded and put the pouch away. Good, she said. Now, has anyone got any tobacco? Half an hour later, the lattes rolled over the Lonkra Bridge, across some of the outlying farmlands, and through the forest that made up most of the kingdom. This is it, said Tom John. Well, not all of it, said Nanny, who had been expecting rather more enthusiasm. There's lots more of it behind the mountains over there, but this is the flat bit. You call this flat? Flattish, Nanny conceded, but the air's good. That's the palace up there, offering outstanding views of the surrounding countryside. You mean forests? You'll like it here, said Nanny encouragingly. It's a bit small. Nanny thought about this. She'd spent nearly all her life inside the boundaries of Lancre. It had always seemed about the right size to her. Please, you, she said. Handy for everywhere. Everywhere where? Nanny gave up. Everywhere close, she said. Howell said nothing. The air was good. Rolling down the unclimbable slopes of the ram tops like a sinus wash, tinted with turpentine from the high forests. They passed through a gateway into what was, up here, probably called a town. The cosmopolitan he had become decided that, down on the plains, it would just about have qualified as an open space. There's an inn, said Tom John doubtfully. Howell followed his gaze. Yes, he said eventually. Yes, it probably is. When are we going to do the play? I don't know. I think we just send up to the castle and say we're here. Howell scratched his chin. Paul said the king, or whatever, would want to see the script. Tom John looked around Lonka Town. It seemed peaceful enough. It didn't look like the kind of place likely to turn actors out at nightfall. It needed the population. This is the capital city of the kingdom, said Nanny Og. Well designed, so you'll notice. Streets, said Tom John. Street, corrected Nanny. Also, houses in quite good repair. Stones throw from river. Throw? Drop, Nanny conceded. Neat middens look, and extensive... Madam, we've come to entertain the town, not buy it, said Howell. Nanny Og looked sidelong at Tom John. Just wanted you to see how attractive it is, she said. Your civic pride does you credit, said Howell. And now please leave the cart. I'm sure you've got some wood together, Lorks. Much obliged for the snack, said Nanny, climbing down. Meals corrected Howell. Tom John nudged him. You ought to be more polite, he said. You never know, he turned to Nanny. Thank you, good... Oh, she's gone. They've come to do a theatre, said Nanny. 
Granny Weatherwax carried on shelling beans in the sun, much to Nanny's annoyance. Well, aren't you going to say something? I've been finding out things, she said, picking up information, not sitting around making soup. Stew. I reckon it's very important, sniffed Nanny. What kind of a theatre? They didn't say. Something for the Duke, I think. What's he want a theatre for? They didn't say that either. It's probably all a trick to get in the castle, Granny said knowingly. Very clever idea. Did you see anything in the carts? Boxes and bundles and such. They'll be full of armour and weapons, depend upon it. Nanny Og looked doubtful. They didn't look very much like soldiers to me. They were awfully young and spotty. Clever. I expect in the middle of the play the king will manifest his destiny, right where everyone can see him. Good plan. There's another thing, said Nanny, picking up a bean pod and chewing it. He don't seem to like the place much. Of course he does. It's in his blood. I brought him the pretty way. He doesn't seem very impressed. Granny hesitated. He was probably suspicious of you, she concluded. He was probably too overcome to speak, really. She put down the bowl of beans and looked thoughtfully at the trees. Have you got any family still working up at the castle? she said. Cheryl and Daff help out in the kitchen since the cook went off his head. Good. I'll have a word with McGrath. I think we should see this theatre. Perfect, said the Duke. Thank you, said Howell. You've got it exactly spot on. About that dreadful accident, said the Duke. You might almost have been there. <laughs> you weren't, were you? said Lady Felmet, leaning forward and glaring at the dwarf. I just used my imagination, said Howell hurriedly. The Duchess glared at him, suggesting that his imagination could consider itself lucky it wasn't being dragged off to the courtyard to explain itself to four angry wild horses and a length of chain. Exactly right, said the Duke, leafing one-handedly through the pages. This is exactly, exactly, exactly how it was. Will have been, snapped the Duchess. The Duke turned another page. You're in this too, he said. Amazing. It's word for word. How I'm going to remember it. I see you've got death in it, too. Always popular, said Howell. People expect it. How soon can you act it? Stage it, corrected Howell, and added, We've tried it out. As soon as you like. And then we can get away from here, he said to himself. Away from your eyes, raw eggs, and this female mountain in the red dress, and this castle which seems to act like a magnet for the wind. This is not going to go down as one of my best plays, I know that much. How much did you say we were going to pay you? said the Duchess. I think you mentioned another hundred silver pieces, said Howell. Worth every penny, said the Duke. Howell left hurriedly before the Duchess could start to bargain, but he felt he'd gladly pay something to be out of this place. Bijou, he thought. God, how could anyone like a kingdom like this? The fool waited in the meadow with the lake. He stared wistfully at the sky and wondered where the hell Magrat was. This was, she said, their place. The fact that a few dozen cows also shared it at the moment didn't appear to make any difference. She turned up in a green dress and a filthy temper. What's all this about a play? she said. The fool sagged onto a willow log. Aren't you glad to see me? he said. 
Well, yes, of course. Now, this play. My lord wants something to convince people that he is the rightful king of Lancre. Himself, mostly, I think. Is that why you went to the city? Yes. It's disgusting. The fool sat calmly. Would you prefer the Duchess's approach? he said. She thinks they ought to kill everyone. She's good at that sort of thing. And then there'd be fighting and everything. Lots of people would die anyway. This way might be easier. Oh, where's your spunk, man? Pardon? Don't you want to die nobly for a just cause? I'd much rather live quietly for one. All right for you witches. You can do what you like, but I'm circumscribed, said the fool. Magrat sat down beside him. Find out all about this play, Granny had ordered. Go and talk to that jingling friend of yours. She'd replied, He's very loyal. He might not tell me anything. And Granny had said, This is no time for half measures. If you have to, seduct him. When's this play going to be, then? She said, moving closer. Mary, I'm not sure I'm allowed to tell you, said the fool. The Duke said to me, he said, don't tell the witches that it's tomorrow night. I shouldn't, then, agreed Magrat. At eight o'clock. I see. But meet me for a sherry beforehand at seven-thirty, of faith. I expect you shouldn't tell me who is invited, either, said Magrat. That's right. Most of the dignitaries of Lancre. You understand I'm not telling you this. That's right, said Magrat. But I think you have a right to know what it is you're not being told. Good point. Is there still that little gate around the back that leads to the kitchens? The one that is often left unguarded? Yes. Oh, we hardly ever guard it these days. Do you think there might be someone guarding it around eight o'clock tomorrow? Well, I might be there. Good. The fool pushed away the wet nose of an inquisitive cow. The Duke will be expecting you, he added. You said he said we weren't to know. He said I mustn't tell you, but he also said they'll come anyway. I hope they do. Strange, really. He seemed to be in a very good mood when he said it. Um, can I see you after the show? Is that all he said? Oh, there was something about showing witches their future. I didn't understand it. I really would like to see you after the show. You know I bought... I think I might be washing my hair, said McGrath vaguely. Excuse me, I really ought to be going. Yes, but I brought you this pres... said the fool vaguely, watching her departing figure. He sagged as she disappeared between the trees and looked down at the necklace wound tightly between his nervous fingers. It was, he had to admit, terribly tasteless, but it was the sort of thing she liked, all silver and skulls. It had cost him too much. A cow, misled by his horns, stuck its tongue in his ear. It was true, the fool thought. Witches did do unpleasant things to people, sometimes. Tomorrow night came and the witches went by a roundabout route to the castle with considerable reluctance. If he wants us to be here, I don't want to go, said Granny. He's got some plan. He's using headology on us. There's something up, said Magrat. He had his men set fire to three cottages in our village last night. He always does that when he's in a good mood. That new sergeant is a quick man with the matches, too. Ah, Das said she saw them actors practice in this morning, said Nanny Og, who was carrying a bag of walnuts and a leather bottle from which rose a rich, sharp smell. She said it was all shouting and stabbing and then wondering who'd done it and long bits with people muttering to themselves in loud voices. Actors, said Granny witheringly, as if the world weren't full of enough history without inventing more. They shout so loud, too, said Nanny. You can hardly hear yourself talk. She was also carrying, deep in her apron pocket, 
a lump of haunted castle rock. The king was getting in free. Granny nodded, but she thought it was going to be worth it. She hadn't got the faintest idea what Tom John had in mind, but her inbuilt sense of drama assured her that the boy would be bound to do something important. She wondered if he would leap off the stage and stab the Duke to death, and realised that she was hoping like hell that he would. All hell, what's name? she said under her breath. Who shall be king here, after? Let's get a move on, said Nanny. All the sherry will be gone. The fool was waiting despondently inside the little wicket gate. His face brightened when he saw McGrath, and then froze in an expression of polite surprise when he saw the other two. There's not going to be any trouble, is there? he said. I don't want there to be any trouble, please. I'm sure I don't know what you mean, said Granny, regally sweeping past. Watch your jingle bells, said Nanny, elbowing the man in the ribs. I hope you haven't been keeping our girl here up late tonight. Nanny, said McGrath, shocked. The fool gave the terrified, ingratiating rictus of young men everywhere when confronted by importunate elderly women commenting on their intimately personal lives. The older witches brushed past. The fool grabbed McGrath's hand. I know where we can get a good view, he said. She hesitated. It's all right, said the fool urgently. You'll be perfectly safe with me. Yes, I will, won't I? said McGrath, trying to look around him to see where the others had gone. They're staging the play outside in the big courtyard. We'll get a lovely view from one of the gate towers, and no one else will be up there. They put some wine up there for us and everything. When she still looked half reluctant, he added, And there's a cistern of water and a fireplace that the guards use sometimes, in case you want to wash your hair. The castle was full of people standing around in that polite, sheepish way affected by people who see each other all day and are now seeing each other again in unusual social circumstances, like an office party. The witches passed quite unremarked among them and found seats in the rows of benches in the main courtyard, set up before a hastily assembled stage. Nanny Og waved her bag of walnuts at Granny. Want one? she said. An older man of Lancre shuffled past her and pointed politely to the seat on her left. Is there anyone sitting here? he said. Yes, said Nanny. The alderman looked distractedly at the rest of the benches, which were filling up fast, and then down at the clearly empty space in front of him. He hitched up his robes with a determined expression. I think that since the play is commencing to start, your friends must find a seat elsewhere when they arrive, he said, and sat down. Within seconds, his face went white, his teeth began to chatter, he clutched at his stomach and groaned. The observant will realise that this was because the king was already seated there. It was not because the man had used the phrase, commence to start, in cold blood, but it ought to have been. I told you, said Nanny, as he lurched away. Good of asking if you're not going to listen. She leaned towards the empty seat. Walnut! No, thank you, said King Barentz, waving a spectral hand. They go right through me, you know. Pray, gentles all, lift to our tail. What's this? hissed Granny. Who's the fellow in the tights? He's the prologue, said Nanny. You have to have him at the beginning so everyone knows what the play's about. Can't understand a word of it, muttered Granny. What's a gentle, anyway? Type a maggot, said Nanny. That's nice, isn't it? Hello, maggots, welcome to the show. Puts people in a nice frame of mind, doesn't it? There was a chorus of shhs. These walnuts are damn tough, said Nanny spitting one out into her hand. I'm going to have to take my shoe off to this one. Granny subsided into an unaccustomed, troubled silence and tried to listen to the prologue. The theatre worried her. It had a magic of its own, one that didn't belong to her, 
one that wasn't in her control. It changed the world and said things were otherwise than they were. And it was worse than that. It was magic that didn't belong to magical people. It was commanded by ordinary people who didn't know the rules. They altered the world, but it sounded better. The Duke and Duchess were sitting on their thrones right in front of the stage. As Granny glared at them, the Duke half turned, and she saw his smile. I want the world the way it is, she thought. I want the past the way it was. The past used to be a lot better than it is now. And the band struck up. Howell peered around a pillar and signaled to Winslow and Bratsley, who hobbled out into the glare of the torches. Old man, an elder. What has befell the land? Old woman, a crone. Tis a terror! The dwarf watched them for a few seconds from the wings, his lips moving soundlessly. Then he scuttled back to the guardroom, where the rest of the cast were still in the last hasty stages of dressing. He uttered the stage manager's traditional scream of rage. Come on! he ordered. Soldiers are right at the double, and the witches. Where are the blasted witches? Three junior apprentices presented themselves. I've lost my ward. The cordon's all full of yuck. There's something living in this wig. Calm down, calm down, screamed Howell. It'll be all right on the night. This is the night, Howell. Howell snatched a handful of putty from the makeup table and slammed on a wart like an orange. The offending straw wig was rammed on its owner's head, livestock and all, and the cauldron was very briefly inspected and pronounced full of just the right sort of yuck. Nothing wrong with yuck like that. On stage, a guard dropped his shield, bent down to pick it up, and dropped his spear. Howell rolled his eyes and offered up a silent prayer to any gods that might be watching. It was already going wrong. The earlier rehearsals had had their little teething troubles, it was true, but Howell had known one or two monumental horrors in his time, and this one was shaping up to be the worst. The company was more jittery than a potful of lobsters. Out of the corner of his ear, he heard the on-stage dialogue falter and scurry to the wings. Avenge the terror of my father's death, he hissed, and hurried back to the trembling witches. He groaned. Divers' alarums. This lot was supposed to be terrorizing a kingdom. He had about a minute before the queue. Right, he said, pulling himself together. Now, what are you? You're evil hags, right? Yes, Hull, they said meekly. Tell me what you are, he commanded. We're evil hags, Hull. Louder! We're evil hags! Howell stalked the length of the quaking line, then turned abruptly on his heel. And what are you going to do? The second witch scratched his crawling wig. We're going to curse people, he ventured. It says in the script, I can't hear you. We're going to curse people, they chorused, springing to attention and staring straight ahead to avoid his gaze. Howell stumped back along the line. What are you? We're hags, Howell. What kind of hag? We're black and midnight hags, they yelled, getting into the spirit. What kind of black and midnight hags? Evil black and midnight hags. Are you scheming? Yeah. Are you secret? Yeah. Howell drew himself to his full height, such as it was. What are you? He screamed. We're scheming evil secret black and midnight hags. Right. He pointed a vibrating finger towards the stage and lowered his voice, and at that moment a dramatic inspiration dived through the atmosphere and slammed into his creative node, causing him to say, Now, I want you to get out there and give them hell. Not for me, not for the goddamn captain. He shifted the butt of an imaginary cigar from one side of his mouth to the other and pushed back a non-existent tin helmet and rasped, For Corporal Wazowski and his little dog. They stared at him in disbelief. On cue, someone shook a sheet of tin and broke the spell. Howell rolled his eyes. He'd grown up in the mountains where thunderstorms stalked from peak to peak on leads of lightning. 
He remembered thunderstorms that left mountains a different shape and flattened whole forests. Somehow, a sheet of tin wasn't the same, no matter how enthusiastically it was shaken. Just once, he thought, just once, let me get it right, just once. He opened his eyes and glared at the witches. What are you hanging around for? he yelled. Get out there and curse them! He watched them scamper onto the stage, and then Tom John tapped him on the head. Howell, there's no crown. Hmm? said the dwarf, his mind wrestling with ways of building thunder and lightning machines. There's no crown, Howell. I've got to wear a crown. Of course there's a crown. The big one with the red glass. Very impressive. We used it in that place with the big square. I think we left it there. There was another tinny roll of thunder, but even so, the part of Howell that was living the play heard a faltering voice on stage. He darted to the wings. I have smothered many a babe, he hissed and sprinted back. Well, just find another one then, he said vaguely, in the props box. You're the evil king, you've got to have a crown. Get on with it, lad. You're on in a few minutes. Improvise. Tom John wandered back to the box. He'd grown up among crowns, big golden crowns made of wood and plaster, studded with finest glass. He'd cut his teeth on the hat brims of authority, but most of them had been left in the disc now. He pulled out collapsible daggers and skulls and vases, the strata of the years, and right at the bottom his fingers closed on something thin and crown-shaped, which no one had ever wanted to wear because it looked so uncrownly. It would be nice to say it tingled under his hand. Perhaps it did. Granny was sitting as still as a statue and almost as cold. The horror of realisation was stealing over her. That's us, she said, round that silly cauldron. That's meant to be us, Gaita. Nanny Og paused with a walnut halfway to her gums. She listened to the words. I never shipwrecked anybody, she said. They just said they shipwrecked people. I never did. Up in the tower, Magrat elbowed the fool in the ribs. Green blusher, she said, staring at the third witch. I don't look like that. I don't, do I? Absolutely not, said the fool. And that hair! The fool peered through the crenellations like an over-eager gargoyle. It looks like straw, he said. Not very clean, either. He hesitated, picking at the lichen stonework with his fingers. Before he'd left the city, he'd asked how for a few suitable words to say to a young lady, and he'd been memorising them on the way home. It was now or never. I'd like to know if I could compare you to a summer's day. Because, well, June 12th was quite nice, and... Oh, you've gone. King Varence gripped the edge of his seat. His fingers went right through it. Tom John did onto the stage. That's him, isn't it? That's my son. The uncracked walnut fell from Nanny Og's fingers and rolled onto the floor. She nodded. Varence turned a haggard, transparent face towards her. What is he doing? What is he saying? Nanny shook her head. The king listened with his mouth open as Tom John, lurching crabwise across the stage, launched into his major speech. I think he's meant to be you, said Nanny distantly. But I never walked like that. Why's he got a hump on his back? What's happened to his leg? He listened some more and added in horrified tones, And I certainly never did that! Or that! Why is he saying I did that? The look he gave Nanny was full of pleading. She shrugged. The king reached up, lifted off his spectral crown, and examined it. 
And it's my crown he's wearing. Look, this is it. And he's saying I did all those... He paused for a moment to listen to the last couplet and added, All right, maybe I did that. So I set fire to a few cottages, but everyone does that. It's good for the building industry anyway. He put the ghostly crown back on his head. Why is he saying all this about me? He pleaded. It's art, said Nanny. It's, what's name? Holds a mirror up to life. Granny turned slowly in her seat to look at the audience. They were staring at the performance, their faces rapt. The words washed over them in the breathless air. This was real. This was more real even than reality. This was history. It might not be true, but that had nothing to do with it. Granny had never had much time for words. It was so insubstantial. Now... She wished that she had found the time. Words were indeed insubstantial. They were as soft as water, but they were also as powerful as water, and now they were rushing over the audience, eroding the levees of veracity and carrying away the past. That's us down there, she thought. Everyone knows who we really are. But the things down there are what they'll remember. Three gibbering old baggages in pointy hats. All we've ever done, all we've ever been, won't exist any more. She looked at the ghost of the king. Well, he'd been no worse than any other king. Oh, he might burn down the odd cottage every now and again in a sort of absent-minded way, but only when he was really angry about something, and he could give it up any time he liked. Where he wounded the world, he left the kind of wounds that healed. Whoever wrote this theatre knew about the uses of magic. Even I believe what's happening, and I know there's no truth in it. This is art holding a mirror up to life. That's why everything is exactly the wrong way round. We've lost. There is nothing we can do against this without becoming exactly what we aren't. Nanny Og gave her a violent nudge in the ribs. Did you hear that? she said. One of them said we put babbies in the cauldron. They've done a slander on me. I'm not sitting here and have them say we put babbies in the cauldron. Granny grabbed her shawl as she tried to stand up. Don't do anything, she hissed. It'll only make things worse. Ditch delivered by a drab, they said. That'll be the young Millie Hipwood, who didn't dare tell her mum, and then went out gathering firewood. I was up all night with that one, Nanny muttered. Fine girl, she produced. It's a slander. What's a drab? she added. Words, said Granny half to herself. That's all that's left. Words. And now there's a man with a trumpet come on. What's he going to do? Oh, end of Act One, said Nanny. The words won't be forgotten, thought Granny. They've got a power to them. They're damn good words, as words go. There was yet another rattle of thunder, which ended in a crash made, for example, by a sheet of tin escaping from someone's hands and hitting the wall. In the world outside the stage, the heat pressed down like a pillow, squeezing the very life out of the air. Granny saw a footman bend down to the Duke's ear. No, he won't stop the play. Of course he won't. He wants it to run its course. The Duke must have felt the heat of her gaze on the back of his neck. He turned, focused on her, and gave her a strange little smile. Then he nudged his wife. They both laughed. Granny Weatherwax was often angry. She considered it one of her strong points. Genuine anger was one of the world's great creative forces, but you had to learn how to control it. That didn't mean you let it trickle away. It meant you damned it, carefully. Let it develop a working head. Let it drown whole valleys of the mind, and then, just when the whole structure was about to collapse, open a tiny pipeline at the base and let the iron-hard stream of wrath power the turbines of revenge. 
she felt the land below her. Even through several feet of foundations, flagstones, one thickness of leather and two thicknesses of sock, she felt it waiting. She heard the king say, My own flesh and blood? Why has he done this to me? I'm going to confront him. She gently took Nanny Og's hand. Come, Geyser, she said. Lord Felmet sat back in his throne and beamed madly at the world, which was looking good right at the moment. Things were working out better than he had dared to hope. He could feel the past melting behind him, like ice in the spring thaw. On an impulse, he called the footman back. Call the captain of the guard, he said, and tell him to find the witches and arrest them. The Duchess snorted. Remember what happened last time, foolish man? We left two of them loose, said the Duke. This time, all three. The tide of public feeling is on our side. That sort of thing affects witches. Depend upon it. The Duchess cracked her knuckles to indicate her view of public opinion. You must admit, my treasure, that the experiment seems to be working. It would appear so. Very well. Don't just stand there, man. Before the play ends, tell him. Those witches are to be under lock and key. Death adjusted his cardboard skull in front of the mirror, twitched his cowl into a suitable shape, stood back, and considered the general effect. It was going to be his first speaking part. He wanted to get it right. Cower now, brief mortals, he said, for I am death, against whom no... 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 How... Against whom no? Oh, good grief, Duffy. Against whom no lock will hold nor fasten portal bar. I really don't see why you have difficulty with... Not that way up, you idiots! Howell strode off through the backstage melee in pursuit of a pair of importunate scene shifters. Right, said Death. To no one in particular, he turned back to the mirror. Against whom no tumpty-tum nor tumpty-tumpty bar, he said uncertainly, and flourished his scythe. The end fell off. Do you think I'm fearsome enough? he said, as he tried to fix it on again. Tom John, who was sitting on his hump and trying to drink some tea, gave him an encouraging nod. No problem, my friend, he said. Compared to a visit from you, even Death himself would hold no fears. But you could try a bit more hollowness. How do you mean? Tom John put down his cup. Shadows seemed to move across his face. His eyes sank. His lips drew back from his teeth. His skin stretched and paled. I have come to get you, you terrible actor, he intoned, each syllable falling into place like a co His features sprang back into shape. Like that, he said. Daffy, who had flattened himself against the wall, relaxed a bit and gave a nervous giggle. <laughs> it does. You know, you do it, he said. Honestly, I'll never be as good as you. There really isn't anything to it. Now run along. Howell's fit to be tied as it is. Daffy gave him a look of gratitude and ran off to help with the scene shifting. Tom John sipped his tea uneasily. The backstage noises whirring around him like so much fog. He was worried. Howell had said that everything about the play was fine except for the play itself. And Tom John kept thinking that the play itself was trying to force itself into a different shape. His mind had been hearing other words, just too faint for hearing. It was almost like eavesdropping on a conversation. He had to shout more to drown out the buzzing in his head. This wasn't right. Once a play was written, it was, well, written. It shouldn't come alive and start twisting itself around. 
No wonder everyone needed prompting all the time. The play was writhing under their hands, trying to change itself. Ye gods, he'd be glad to get out of this spooky castle and away from this mad duke. He glanced around, decided that it would be some time before the next act was called, and wandered aimlessly in search of fresher air. A door yielded to his touch, and he stepped out onto the battlements. He pushed it shut behind him, cutting off the sounds of the stage and replacing them by a velvet hush. There was a livid sunset imprisoned behind bars of cloud, but the air was as still as a millpond and as hot as a furnace. In the forest below, some night birds screamed. He walked to the other end of the battlements and peered down into the sheer depths of the gorge. Far beneath, the lancra boiled in its eternal mists. He turned and walked into a draught of such icy coldness that he gasped. Unusual breezes plucked at his clothing. There was a strange muttering in his ear, as though someone was trying to talk to him, but couldn't get the speed right. He stood rigid for a moment, getting his breath, and then fled for the door. But we're not witches! Why'd you look like them, then? Tie their hands, lads. Yes, excuse me, but we're not really witches! The captain of the guard looked from face to face. His gaze took in their pointy hats, the disordered hair smelling of damp haystacks, the sickly green complexions, and the herd of warts. Guard captain for the Duke wasn't a job that offered long-term prospects for those who used initiative. Three witches had been called for, and these seemed to fit the bill. The captain never went to the theatre. When he was on the rack of adolescence, he had been badly frightened by a Punch and Judy show, and since then he had taken pains to avoid any organised entertainment, and had kept away from anywhere where crocodiles could conceivably be expected. He'd spent the last hour enjoying a quiet drink in the guardroom. I said tar their hands, didn't I? He snapped. Shall we gag them as well, Captain? But if you just listen, we're with the theatre! Yes said the captain, shuddering. Gag them. Please! The captain leaned down and stared at three pairs of frightened eyes. He was trembling. That, he said, is the last time you'll eat anyone's sausage. He was aware that now the soldiers were giving him odd looks as well. He coughed and pulled himself together. Very well, then. My theatrical witches, he said, you've done your show, and now it's time for your applause. He nodded to his men. Clap them in chains, he said. Three other witches sat in the gloom behind the stage, staring vacantly into the darkness. Granny Weatherwax had picked up a copy of the script, which she peered at from time to time, as if seeking ideas. Divers alarums and excursions, she read uncertainly. That means lots of terrible happenings, said McGrath. You always put that in plays. Alarums and what? said Nanny Og, who hadn't been listening. Excursions, said McGrath patiently. Oh, Nanny Og brightened a bit. The seaside would be nice, she said. Do shut up, Gaita. Said Granny Weatherwax. They're not for you. They're only for divers, like it says. Probably so they can recover from all their alarums. We can't let this happen, said McGrath, quickly and loudly. If this gets about, witches will always be old hags with green blusher. And meddling in the affairs of kings, said Nanny, which we never do, as is well known. It's not the meddling I object to, said Granny Weatherwax her chin on her hand. It's the evil meddling. And the unkindness to animals, muttered McGrath. All that stuff about the eye of dog and ear of toad. No one uses that kind of stuff. Granny Weatherwax and Nanny Og carefully avoided one another's faces. Drab, 
said Nanny Og bitterly. Witches just aren't like that, said Magrat. We live in harmony with the great cycles of nature and do no harm to anyone, and it's wicked of them to say we don't. We ought to fill their bones with hot lead. The other two looked at her with a certain amount of surprised admiration. She blushed, although not greenly, and looked at her knees. Goody Wemper did a recipe, she confessed. It's quite easy. What you do is, you get some lead and you... I don't think that would be appropriate, said Granny carefully, after a certain amount of internal struggle. It could give people the wrong idea. But not for long, said Nanny, wistfully. No, we can't be having with that sort of thing, said Granny, a little more firmly this time. We'd never hear the last of it. Why don't we just change the words, said Magrat. When they come back on stage, we could just put the fluence on them so they forget what they're saying and give them some new words. I suppose you're an expert at theatre words, said Granny sarcastically. They'd have to be the proper sort, otherwise people would suspect. Shouldn't be too difficult, said Nanny Og dismissively. I've been studying it. You go tumpty, tumpty, tumpty. Granny gave this some consideration. There's more to it than that, I believe, she said. Some of those speeches were very good. I couldn't understand hardly any of it. There's no trick to it at all, Nanny Og insisted. Anyway, half of them are forgetting their lines as it is. It'll be easy. We could put words in their mouths, said McGrath. Nanny Og nodded. I don't know about new words, she said, but we could make them forget these words. They both looked at Granny Weatherwax. She shrugged. I suppose it's worth a try, she conceded. Witches as yet unborn will thank us for it, said McGrat ardently. Oh, good, said Granny. At last! What are you three playing at? We've been looking for you everywhere. The witches turned to see an irate dwarf trying to loom over them. Us? said Magrat. But we're not in... Oh, yes, you are. Remember, we put you in last week, Act Two, downstage around the cauldron. You haven't got to say anything. You're symbolising occult forces at work. Just be as wicked as you can. Come on, there's good lads. We've done well so far. Howell slapped McGrath on the bottom. Good complexion you got there, Wilf, he said encouragingly. But for goodness sake, use a bit more padding. You're still the wrong shape. Fine warts there, Billum, I must say, he added, standing back. You look as nasty a bunch of hags as a body might hope to clap eyes on. Well done. Shame about the wigs. Now to run along. Curtain up in one minute. Break a leg. He gave McGrath another ringing slap on her rump slightly hurting his hand, and hurried off to shout at someone else. None of the witches dared to speak. Magrat and Nanny Og found themselves instinctively turning toward Granny. She sniffed. She looked up. She looked around. She looked at the brightly lit stage behind her. She brought her hands together with a clap that echoed round the castle and then rubbed them together. So, she said grimly. Let's do the show right here. Nanny squinted sullenly after Howell. Break your own leg, she muttered. Howell stood in the wings and gave the signal for the curtain, and for the thunder. It didn't come. Thunder! he hissed in a voice heard by half the audience. Get on with it! A voice from behind the nearest pillar wailed. I went and bent the thunder, Howell. It just goes clonk, clonk. Howell stood silent for a moment, counting. The company watched him, awestruck, but not, unfortunately, thunderstruck. At last, he raised his fists to the open sky and said, I wanted a storm, just a storm, not even a big storm, any storm. Now, I want to make myself absolutely clear. I've had enough. I want thunder right now.
stab of lightning that answered him turned the multi-hued shadows of the castle into blinding white and searing black. It was followed by a roll of thunder, on cue. It was the loudest noise Howl had ever heard. It seemed to start inside his head and work its way outwards. It went on and on, shaking every stone in the castle. Dust rained down. A distant turret broke away with balletic slowness and, tumbling end over end, dropped gently into the hungry depths of the gorge. When it finished, it left a silence that rang like a bell. Howell looked up at the sky. Great black clouds were blowing across the castle, blotting out the stars. The storm was back. It had spent ages learning its craft. It had spent years lurking in distant valleys. It had practiced for hours in front of a glacier. It had studied the great storms of the past. It had honed its art to perfection. And now, tonight, with what it could see was clearly an appreciative audience waiting for it, it was going to take them by, well, tempest. Howell smiled. Perhaps the gods did listen, after all. He wished he'd asked for a really good wind machine as well. He gestured frantically at Tom John. Get on with it! The boy nodded and launched into his main speech. And now our domination is complete. Behind him on the stage, the witches bent over the cauldron. It's just tin, this one, hissed Nanny. And it's full of all yuck. And the fire is just red paper, whispered Magrat. It looks so real from up there. It's just red paper. Look, you can poke it. Never mind, said Granny. Just look busy and wait until I say. As the evil king and the good duke began the exchange that was going to lead to the exciting duel scene, they became uncomfortably aware of activity behind them and occasional chuckles from the audience. After a totally inappropriate burst of laughter, Tom John risked a sideways glance. One of the witches was taking their fire to bits. Another one was trying to clean the cauldron. The third one was sitting with her arms folded, glaring at him. The very soul cries out at tyranny, said Wimslow, and then caught the expression on Tom John's face and followed his gaze. His voice trailed into silence. And calls me forth for vengeance, prompted Tom John helpfully. <coughs> whispered Wimslow, trying to point surreptitiously with his dagger. I wouldn't be seen dead with a cauldron like this, said Nanny Og, in a whisper loud enough to carry to the back of the courtyard. Two days' work with a scourer and a bucket of sand is this. And called me forth for vengeance, this Tom John. Out of the tail of his eye, he saw Howl in the wings, frozen in an attitude of incoherent rage. How do they make it flicker? said McGrath. Be quiet, you two. You're upsetting people. She raised her hat to Wimslow. And don't mind us. What? said Wimslow. Aha! It calls you forth for vengeance, does it? said Tom John in desperation. And the heavens cry revenge too, I expect. On cue, the storm produced a thunderbolt that blew the top off another tower. The Duke crouched in his seat, his face a panorama of fear. He extended what once had been a finger. There they are, he breathed. That's them! What are they doing in my play? Who said they could be in my play? The Duchess, who was less inclined to deal in rhetorical questions, beckoned to the nearest guard. On stage, Tom John was sweating under the load of the script. Winslow was incoherent. Now Gumridge, who was playing the part of the good Duchess in a wig of flax, had lost the thread as well. Aha! Thou callest me an evil king! Though thou whisperest it so, none save I may hear it, Tom John croaked. And thou hast summoned the guard? 
possibly by some secret signal owing nought to artifice of lips or tongue. A guard came on crabwise, still stumbling from Howell's shove. He stared at Granny Weatherwax. Howell says, what the hell's going on? He hissed. What was that? said Tom John. Did I hear you say, I come, my lady? Get these people off, he says. Tom John advanced to the front of the stage. Thou babblest, man! See how I dodged thou torture spear! I said, See how I dodged thy torture spear! Thy spear, man! You're holding it in thy bloody hand, for goodness sake! The guard gave him a desperate frozen grin. Tom John hesitated. Three other actors around him were staring fixedly at the witches. Looming up in front of him, with all the inevitability of a tax demand, was a sword fight during which, it was beginning to appear, he would have to parry his own wild thrusts and stab himself to death. He turned to the three witches, his mouth open. For the first time in his life, his awesome memory let him down. He could think of nothing to say. Granny Weatherwax stood up. She advanced to the edge of the stage. The audience held its breath. She held up a hand. Ghosts of the mind, and all device away, I bid the truth to have... She hesitated. It's tumpty tumpty day. Tom John felt the chill engulf him. The others, too, jolted into life. Up from out of the depths of their blank minds, new words rushed, words red with blood and revenge, words that had echoed among the castle stones, words stored in silicone, words that would have themselves heard, words that gripped their mouths so tightly that an attempt not to say them would result in a broken jaw. Do you fear him now? said Gumridge. And he so mazed with drink? Take his dagger, husband. You are a blade's width from the kingdom. I dare not, Wimslow said, trying to look in astonishment at his own lips. Who will know? Gumridge waved a hand towards the audience. He'd never act so well again. See, there's only Eilis Knight. Take the dagger now. Take the kingdom tomorrow. Have a stab at it, man! Wimslow's hand shook. I have it, wife, he said. Is this a dagger I see before me? Of course it's a bloody dagger! Come on, do it now! The weak deserve no mercy! We'll say he fell down the stairs! But people will suspect. Are there no dungeons? Are there no pillywinks? Possession is nine parts of the law, husband! When what you possess is a knife, Wimslow drew his arm back. I cannot. He has been kindness itself to me. And you can be death itself to him. Daffy could hear the voices a long way off. He adjusted his mask, checked the deathliness of his appearance in the mirror, and peered at the script in the empty backstage gloom. Cower no brief mortal, she said. I am death. Gainst who? Gainst who? Whom? Oh, thanks, said the boy distractedly. Gainst whom no lock may hold, will hold, nor fastened portal bar. Here, to... 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 Here to take my tally on this night of kings. Duffy sagged. Oh, you're so much better at it, he moaned. You've got the right voice and you can remember the words. He turned around. It's only three lines and how will... Have my guts... He froze. His eyes widened and became two saucers of fear as death snapped his fingers in front of the boy's rigid face. Forget, he commanded, and turned and stalked silently towards the wings. His eyeless skull took in the line of costumes, 
the waxy debris of the makeup table. His empty nostrils snuffed up the mixed smells of mothballs, grease, and sweat. There was something here, he thought, that nearly belonged to the gods. Humans had built a world inside the world which reflected it in pretty much the same way as a drop of water reflects the landscape, and yet, and yet, inside this little world, they had taken pains to put all the things you might think they would want to escape from. Hatred, fear, tyranny and so forth. Death was intrigued. They thought they wanted to be taken out of themselves, and every art humans dreamt up took them further in. He was fascinated. He was here for a very particular and precise purpose. There was a soul to be claimed. There was no time for inconsequentialities. But what was time, after all? His feet did an involuntary little clicking dance across the stones, alone in the grey shadows. Death tap danced. The next night in your dressing room they hang a star. He pulled himself together, adjusted his scythe, and waited silently for his cue. He'd never missed one yet. He was going to get out there and slay them. And you can be death itself to him! Now! Death entered, his feet clicking across the stage. Cower now, brief mortals, for I am death, against whom no... Uh, no... against whom... He hesitated. He hesitated for the very first time in the eternity of his existence. For although the death of the Discworld was used to dealing with people by the million, at the same time, every death was intimate and personal. Death was seldom seen except by those of an occult persuasion and his clients themselves. The reason that no one else saw him was that the human brain is clever enough to edit sights too horrible for it to cope with. But the problem here was that several hundred people were in fact expecting to see death at this point and were therefore seeing him. Death turned slowly and stared back at the hundreds of watching eyes. Even in the grip of the truth, Tom John recognised a fellow actor in distress and fought for mastery of his lips. Lock will hold, he whispered, through teeth fixed in a grimace. Death gave him a manic grin of stage fright. What? he whispered, in a voice like an anvil being hit with a small lead hammer. Lock will hold your fastened portal, said Tom John encouragingly. Lock will hold nor fastened portal, uh... repeated Death, desperately watching his lips. Bah! Bah! No! I cannot do it, said Winslow. I will be seen. Down there in the hall, someone watches. There is no one. I feel the stare. Dithering idiot, must I put in for you? See, his foot is upon the top stair. Winslow's face contorted with fear and uncertainty. He drew back his hand. No! The scream came from the audience. The Duke was half risen from his seat, his tortured knuckles in his mouth. As they watched, he lurched forward between the shocked people. No! I did not do it! It was not like that! You cannot say it was like that! You were not there! He stared at the upturned faces around him and sagged. No, was I, he giggled. I was asleep at the time, you know, I remember it quite well. There was blood on the counterpane, there was blood on the floor. I could not wash off the blood. But these are not proper subjects for the inquiry. I cannot allow the discussion of national security. It was just a dream. And when I awoke, he'd be alive tomorrow. 
And tomorrow it wouldn't have happened because it was not done. And tomorrow you can say, I did not know. And tomorrow you can say, I had no recollection. What a noise he made in falling, enough to wake the dead. Who'd have thought he had so much blood in him? By now, he had climbed onto the stage and grinned brightly at the assembled company. I hope that sorts it all out, he said. <laughs> In the silence that followed, Tom John opened his mouth to utter something suitable, something soothing, and found that there was nothing he could say. But another personality stepped into him, took over his lips, and spoke thusly. With my own bloody dagger, you bastard! I know it was you! I saw you at the top of the stairs, sucking your thumb— I'd kill you now, except for the thought of having to spend eternity listening to your whining. I, Varence, formerly king of— What testimony is this? said the Duchess. She stood in front of the stage, with half a dozen soldiers beside her. These are just slanders, she added. And treason to boot, the rantings of mad players. I was bloody king of Lancre shouted Tom John. In which case you are the alleged victim, said the Duchess calmly, and are unable to speak for the prosecution. It is against all precedent. Tom John's body turned towards death. You were there. You saw it all. I suspect I would not be considered an appropriate witness. Therefore there is no proof, and where there is no proof there is no crime said the Duchess. She motioned the soldiers forward. So much for your experiment, she said to her husband. I think my way is better. She looked around the stage and found the witches. Arrest them, she said. No, said the fool, stepping out of the wings. What did you say? I saw it all, said the fool simply. I was in the great hall that night. You killed the king, my lord. I did not, screamed the duke. You are not there. I did not see you there. I order you not to be there. You did not dare say this before, said Lady Felmont. Yes, lady, but I must say it now. The duke focused unsteadily on him. You swore loyalty unto death, my fool, he hissed. Yes, my lord, I'm sorry. You're dead! The duke snatched a dagger from Winslow's unresisting hand, darted forward, and plunged it to the hilt into the fool's heart. Macrat screamed. The fool rocked back and forth unsteadily. Thank goodness that's over, he said as Magrat pushed her way through the actors and clasped him to what could charitably be called her bosom. It struck the fool that he had never looked at a bosom squarely in the face, at least since he was a baby, and it was particularly cruel of the world to save the experience until after he was dead. He gently moved one of Magrat's arms and pulled the despicable horned cow from his head and tossed it as far as possible. He didn't have to be a fool any more, or, he realised, bother about vows or anything. What with bosoms as well, death seemed to be an improvement. Wait it, said the Duke. No pain, thought the fool. Funny that. On the other hand, you obviously can't feel pain when you are dead. It would be wasted. You all saw that I didn't do it, said the Duke. Death gave the fool a puzzled look. Then he reached into the recesses of his robe and pulled out an hourglass. It had bells on it. He gave it a gentle shake, which made them tinkle. I gave no orders that any such thing should be done, said the Duke calmly. His voice came from a long way off, from wherever his mind was now. The company stared at him wordlessly. It wasn't possible to hate someone like this, only to feel a 
acutely embarrassed about being anywhere near him. Even the fool felt embarrassed, and he was dead. Death tapped the hourglass, and then peered at it to see if it had gone wrong. You're all lying, said the Duke in tranquil tones. Telling lies is naughty. He stabbed several of the nearest actors in a dreamy, gentle way, and then held up the blade. You see, he said, no blood. It wasn't me. He looked up at the Duchess, towering over him now like a red tsunami over a small fishing village. It was her, he said. She did it. He stabbed her once or twice on general principles, and then stabbed himself, and let the dagger drop from his fingers. After a few seconds' reflection, he said in a voice far nearer the worlds of sanity, You can't get me now. He turned to death. Will there be a comet? He said. There must be a comet when a prince dies. I'll go and see, shall I? He wandered away. The audience broke into applause. You've got to admit, he was real royalty, said Nanny Og, eventually. It only goes to show royalty goes eccentric far better than the likes of you and me. Death held the hourglass to his skull, his face radiating puzzlement. Granny Weatherwax picked up the fallen dagger and tested the blade with her finger, it slid into the handle quite easily, with a faint squeaking noise. She passed it to Nanny. There's your magic sword, she said. McGrath looked at it, and then back at the fool. Are you dead or not? she said. I must be, said the fool, his voice slightly muffled. I think I'm in paradise. No, look, I'm serious. I don't know, but I like to breathe. Then you must be alive. Everyone's alive, said Granny. It's a trick dagger. Actors probably can't be trusted with real ones. After all, they can't even keep a cauldron clean, said Nanny. Whether everyone is alive or not is a matter for me, said the Duchess. As ruler, it is my pleasure to decide. Clearly my husband has lost his wits. She turned to her soldiers. And I decree... Now! hissed King Lorenz in Granny's ear. Now! Granny Weatherwax drew herself up. Be silent, woman, she said. The true King of Lancre stands before you. She clapped Tom John on the shoulder. What, him? Who, me? Ridiculous, said the Duchess. He's a mama of sorts. She's right, miss, said Tom John, on the edge of panic. My father runs a theatre, not a kingdom. He is the true king. We can prove it, said Granny. Oh, no, said the Duchess. We're not having that. There's no mysterious returned heirs in this kingdom. Guards, take him! Granny Weatherwax held up a hand. The soldiers lurched from foot to foot uncertainly. He's a witch, isn't she? said one of them, tentatively. Certainly, said the Duchess. The guard uneasily. We've seen where they turn people into newts, said one. And then shipwreck them. Yeah, and alarm the divers. Yeah. We ought to talk about this. We ought to get extra for witches. She could do anything to us, look. She could be a drab, even. Don't be foolish, said the Duchess. Witches don't do that sort of thing. They're just stories to frighten people. The guard shook his head. It looked pretty convincing to me. Of course it did. It was meant, the Duchess began. She sighed and snatched a spear out of the guard's hand. <sighs> I'll show you the power of these witches, she said, and hurled it at Granny's face. 
Granny moved her hand across at snake-bite speed and caught the spear just behind the head. So, she said, and it comes to this, does it? You don't frighten me, weird sisters, said the Duchess. Granny stared her in the eye for a few seconds. She gave a grunt of surprise. You're right, she said. We really don't, do we? Do you think I haven't studied you? Your witchcraft is all artifice and illusion to amaze weak minds. It holds no fear for me. Do your worst. Granny studied her for a while. My worst, she said eventually. Magrat and Nanny Og shuffled gently out of the way. The Duchess laughed. You're clever, <laughs> she said. I'll grant you that much. And quick. Come on, hag. Bring on your toads and demons. I'll... She stopped, her mouth opening and shutting a bit without any words emerging. Her lips drew back in a rictus of terror. Her eyes looked beyond Granny, beyond the world, towards something else. One knuckled hand flew to her mouth, and she made a little whimpering noise. She froze, like a rabbit that had just seen a stoat and knows, without any doubt, that this is the last stoat that it will ever see. What have you done to her? said Magrat, the first to dare to speak. Granny smirked. Edology, said Granny, and smirked. You don't need any Black Alice magic for it. Yes, but what have you done? No one becomes like she is without building walls inside her head, she said. I've just knocked them down. Every scream, every plea, every pang of guilt, every twinge of conscience, all at once. There's a little trick to it. She gave Magrat a condescending smile. I'll show you one day, if you like. Magrat thought about it. It's horrible, she said. Nonsense. Granny smiled terribly. Everyone wants to know their true self. Now she does. Sometimes you have to be kind to be cruel, said Nanny Og approvingly. I think it's probably the worst thing that could happen to anyone, said Magrat, as the Duchess swayed backwards and forwards. For goodness sake, use your imagination, girl, said Granny. There are far worse things. Needles under the fingernails, for one. Stuff with pliers. Red hot knives up the jacksy, said Nanny Og. Handle first, too, so you can cut your fingers trying to pull them out. This is simply the worst that I can do, said Granny Weatherwax primly. It's all right and proper, too. A witch should act like that, you know. There's no need for any dramatic stuff. Most magic goes on in the head. It's headology. Now, if you... A noise like a gas leak escaped from the Duchess's lips. Her head jerked back suddenly. She opened her eyes, blinked, and focused on Granny. Sheer hatred suffused her features. Gods! she said. I told you to take them! Granny's jaw sagged. What? she said. But... but I showed you your true self. I'm supposed to be upset by that, am I? As sheepishly grabbed Granny's arms, the Duchess pressed her face close to Granny's. Her tremendous eyebrows, a V of triumphant hatred. I'm supposed to grovel on the floor, is that it? Well, old woman... I've seen exactly what I am, do you understand? And I'm proud of it. I'll do it all again, only hotter and longer. I enjoyed it, and I did it because I wanted to. She thumped the vast expanse of her chest. You gobbling idiots, she said. You're so weak. You really think that people are basically decent underneath it, don't you? The crowd on the stage backed away from the sheer force of her exultation. Well, I've looked underneath, 
said the Duchess. I know what drives people. It's fear. Sheer, deep down fear. There's not one of you who doesn't fear me. I can make you whittle your drawers out of terror, and now I'm going to take... At this point, Nanny Og hit her on the back of the head with the cauldron. She does go on, doesn't she? she said conversationally as the Duchess collapsed. She was a bit eccentric, if you ask me. There was a long, embarrassed silence. Granny Weatherwax coughed. Then she treated the soldiers holding her to a bright, friendly smile and pointed to the mound that was now the Duchess. Take her away and put her in a cell somewhere, she commanded. The men snapped to attention grabbed the Duchess by her arms and pulled her upright with considerable difficulty. Gently, mind, said Granny. She rubbed her hands together and turned to Tom John, who was watching her with his mouth open. Depend upon it, she hissed. Here and now, my lad, you don't have a choice. You're the King of Lancre. But I don't know how to be a king. We all feed you. You had it down just right, including the shouting. That's just acting. Act, then. Being a king is... is... Granny hesitated and snapped her fingers at McGrath. What do you call them things? There's always a hundred of them in anything. McGrath looked bewildered. Do you mean percents? She said. Them, agreed Granny. Most of the percents in being a king is acting, if you ask me. You ought to be good at it. Tom John looked for help into the wings, where Hal should have been. The dwarf was in fact there, but he wasn't paying much attention. He had the script in front of him and was rewriting furiously. But I assure you, you are not dead. Take it from me. The Duke giggled. He had found a sheet from somewhere and had draped it over himself and was sidling along some of the castle's more deserted corridors. Sometimes he would go in a low voice. This worried death. He was used to people claiming that they were not dead because death always came as a shock and a lot of people had some trouble getting over it but people claiming that they were dead with every breath in their body was a new and unsettling experience. I shall jump out on people, said the Duke dreamily. I shall rattle my bones all night. I shall perch on the roof and foretell death in the house. That's Banshee. I shall if I want, said the Duke, with a trace of earlier determination. And I shall float through walls and knock on tables and drip ectoplasm on anyone I don't like. <laughs> it won't work. Living people aren't allowed to be ghosts. I'm sorry. The Duke made an unsuccessful attempt to float through a wall, gave up, and opened a door out to a crumbling section of the battlements. The storm had died away a bit, and a thin rind of moon lurked behind the clouds like a ticket tout for eternity. Death stalked through the wall behind him. Well, then, said the Duke, if I'm not dead, why are you here? He jumped up on the wall and flapped his sheet. Waiting. Wait forever, Boneface, said the Duke triumphantly. I shall hover in the twilight world. I shall find some chains to shake. I shall. He stepped backwards lost his balance, landed heavily on the wall, and slid. For a moment, the remnant of his right hand scrabbled ineffectually at the stonework, and then vanished. Death is obviously potentially everywhere at the same time, and in one sense it is no more true to say that he was on the battlements, picking vaguely at non-existent particles of glowing metal on the edge of his scythe blade, than that he was waist-deep in the foaming, rock-toothed waters in the depths of Lonkra Gorge, 
his calcareous gaze sweeping downwards and stopping abruptly at the point where the torrent ran a few treacherous inches over a bed of angular pebbles. After a while, the Duke sat up, transparent in the phosphorescent waves. I shall halt the corridors, he said, and whisper under the doors on still nights. His voice grew fainter, almost lost in the ceaseless roar of the river. I shall make basket chairs creak most alarmingly. Just you wait and see. Death grinned at him. Now you're talking. It started to rain. Ramtop rain has a curiously penetrative quality, which makes ordinary rain seem almost arid. It poured in torrents over the castle roofs, and somehow seemed to go right through the tiles and fill the great hall with a warm, uncomfortable moistness, like Bogner. The hall was crowded with half the population of Lancre. Outside, the rushing of the rain even drowned out the distant roar of the river. It soaked the stage. The colours ran and mingled in the painted backdrop, and one of the curtains sagged away from its rail and flapped sadly into a puddle. Inside, Granny Weatherwax finished speaking. You forgot about the crown, whispered Nanny Og. Ah, said Granny. Yes, the crown. It's on his head. You see, we hid it among the crowns. When the actors left, the reason being, no one would look for it there. See how it fits him so perfectly. It was a tribute to Granny's extraordinary powers of persuasion, but everyone did see how perfectly it fitted Tom John. In fact, the only one who didn't was Tom John himself, who was aware that it was only his ears that were stopping it becoming a necklace. Imagine the sensation when he put it on for the first time, she went on. I expect there was an eldritch tingling sensation. Actually, it felt rather... Tom John began, but no one was listening to him. He shrugged and leaned over to Howell, who was still scribbling busily. Does eldritch mean uncomfortable? he hissed. The dwarf looked at him with unfocused eyes. What? I said, does Eldritch mean uncomfortable? Eh? Oh. No. No, I shouldn't think so. What does it mean, then? Dunno. Oblong, I think. Howell's glance returned to his scrawl as though magnetised. Can you remember what he said after all those tomorrows? I didn't catch the bit after that. And there wasn't any need for you to tell everyone I was adopted, said Tom John. That's how it was, you see, said the dwarf vaguely. Best to be honest about these things. Now then, did he actually stab her or just accuse her? I don't want to be a king, Tom John whispered hoarsely. Everyone says I'll take after Dad. Funny thing, all this tanking after people, said the dwarf vaguely. I mean, if I took after my dad, I'd be a hundred feet underground digging rocks, whereas... His voice died away. He stared at the nib of his pen as though it held an incredible fascination. But... Eh? Aren't you even listening? I knew it was wrong when I wrote it. I knew it was the wrong way round. What? Oh, yes. Be a king. It's a good job. It seems there's a lot of competition at any rate. I'm very happy for you. Once you're a king, you can do anything you want. Tom John looked at the faces of the Lancre worthies around the table. They had a keen, calculating look, like the audience at a fat stock show. They were weighing him up. It crept upon him, in a cold and clammy way, that once he was king, he could do anything he wanted, provided that what he wanted to do was be king. 
You could build up your own theatre, said Howell, his eyes lighting up for a moment. With as many trapdoors as you wanted, and magnificent costumes, you could act in a new play every night. I mean, it would make the disc look like a shed. Would you come and see me? said Tom John, sagging in his seat. Everyone. What? Every night? You could order them to, said Howell, without looking up. I knew he was going to say that, Tom John thought. He can't really mean it, he added charitably. He's got his play. He doesn't really exist in this world, not right now at the moment. He took off the crown and turned it over and over in his hands. There wasn't much metal in it, but it felt heavy. He wondered how heavy it would get if he wore it all the time. At the head of the table was an empty chair containing, he had been assured, the ghost of his real father. It would have been nice to report that he had experienced anything more, when being introduced to it, than an icy sensation and a buzzing in the ears. I suppose I could help Father pay off the disc, he said. That would be nice, yes, said Howell. He spun the crown in his fingers and listened glumly to the talk flowing back and forth over his head. Fifteen years, said the Mayor of Lancre. We had to, said Granny Weatherwax. I thought the baker was a bit early last week. No, no said the witch impatiently. It doesn't work like that. No one's lost anything. According to my figuring, said the man who doubled as Lancre's beadle, town clerk and gravedigger, we've all lost fifteen years. No, we've all gained them, said the mayor. Stands to reason. Time's like this sort of wiggly road, see? But we took a shortcut across the fields. Not at all, said the clerk, sliding a sheet of paper across the table. Look here. Tom John let the waters of debate close over him again. Everyone wanted him to be king. No one thought twice about what he wanted. His views didn't count. Yes, that was it. No one wanted him to be king. Not precisely him. He just happened to be convenient. Gold does not tarnish, at least physically, but Tom John felt that the thin band of metal in his hand had an unpleasant depth to its luster. It had sat on too many troubled heads. If you held it to your ear, you could hear the screams. He became aware of someone else looking at him, their gaze playing across his face like a blow lamp on a lolly. He looked up. It was the third witch. The young, the youngest one, with the intense expression and the hedgerow hairstyle, sitting next to old fool, as though she owned a controlling interest. It wasn't his face she was examining, it was his features. Her eyeballs were tracking him from nape to nose like a pair of calipers. He gave her a little brave smile, which she ignored just like everyone else, he thought. Only the fool noticed him, and returned the smile with an apologetic grin and a tiny conspiratorial wave of the fingers that said, What are we doing here, two sensible people like us? The woman was looking at him again, turning her head and that and narrowing her eyes. She kept glancing at the fool and back to Tom John. Then she turned to the oldest witch, the only person in the entire hot, damp room who seemed to have acquired a mug of beer, and whispered in her ear. The two started a spirited, whispered conversation. It was, thought Tom John, a particularly feminine way of talking. It normally took place on doorsteps, with all the participants standing with their arms folded, and if anyone was so ungracious as to walk past, they'd stop abruptly and watch them in silence until they were safely out of earshot. He became aware that Granny Weatherwax had stopped talking, and that the entire hall was staring at him expectantly. Hello, he said. It might be a good idea to hold the coronation tomorrow, said Granny, 
It's not good for a kingdom to be without a ruler. It doesn't like it. She stood up, pushed back her chair, and came and took Tom John's hand. He followed her unprotestingly across the flagstones and up the steps to the throne, where she had put her hands on his shoulders and pressed him gently down onto the threadbare red, plush cushions. There was a scraping of benches and chairs. He looked around in panic. What's happening now? he said. Don't worry, said Granny firmly. Everyone wants to come and swear loyalty to you. You just nod graciously and ask everyone what they do and if they enjoy it. Oh, and you'd better give them the crown back. Tom John removed it quickly. Why? he said. They want to present it to you. But I've already got it, said Tom John desperately. Granny gave a patient sigh. Only in the, what's the name, real sense, she said. This is more ceremonial. You mean unreal? Yes, said Granny, but much more important. Tom John gripped the arms of the throne. Fetch me, Hull, he said. No, you must do it like that. It's precedent, you see. First you meet the... I said, fetch me the dwarf. Didn't you hear me, woman? This time, Tom John got the spin and pitch of his voice just right. But Granny rallied magnificently. I don't think you quite realize who you are talking to, young man, she said. Tom John half rose in his seat. He had played a great many kings, and most of them weren't the kind of kings who shook hands graciously and asked people whether they enjoyed their work. They were far more the type of kings who got people to charge into battle at five o'clock on freezing mornings and still managed to persuade them that this was better than being in bed. He summoned them all and treated Granny Weatherwax to a blast of royal hauteur, pride and arrogance. We thought we were talking to a subject, he said. Now, do as we say. Granny's face was immobile for several seconds as she worked out what to do next. Then she smiled to herself, said lightly, As you wish and went and dislodged Howell, who was still writing. The dwarf gave a stiff bow. None of that, snapped Tom John. What do I do next? I don't know. Do you want me to write an acceptance speech? I told you I don't want to be king. Would be a problem with an acceptance speech, then, the dwarf agreed. You really thought about this. Being king is a great role. But it's the only one you get to play. Hmm. Well, just tell them no, then. Just like that? Will it work? It's got to be worth a try. A group of Lancre dignitaries were approaching with the crown on a cushion. They wore expressions of constipated respect, coupled with just a hint of self-satisfaction. They carried the crown as if it was a present for a good boy. The mayor of Lancre coughed behind his hand. A proper coronation will take some time to arrange, he began. But we would like... No, said Tom John. The mayor hesitated. Pardon, he said. I won't accept it. The mayor hesitated again. His lips moved and his eyes glazed slightly. He felt that he had got lost somewhere and decided it would be best to start again. A uh, proper coronation will take... he ventured. It won't, said Tom John. I will not be king. The mayor was mouthing like a carp. Howell, said Tom John desperately. You're good with words. The problem we've got here, said the dwarf, is that no is apparently not among the options when you're offered a crown. I think he could cope with maybe... Tom John stood up and grabbed the crown. He held it above his head like a tambourine. Listen to me, all of you, he said. I thank you for your offer. It is a great honor, but I can't accept it. I've worn more crowns than you can count, and the only kingdom I know how to rule has got curtains in front of it. I'm sorry. Dead silence greeted this. They did not appear to have been the right words. 
Another problem, said Howell conversationally, is that you don't actually have a choice. You are the king, you see. It's a job you're lined up for when you are born. I'd be no good at it. That doesn't matter. A king isn't something you're good at. It's something you are. You can't leave me here. There's nothing but forests. Tom John felt the suffocating cold sensation again and the slow buzzing in his ears. For a moment, he thought he saw, faint as a mist, a tall, sad man in front of him, stretching out a hand in supplication. I'm sorry, he whispered. I really am. Through the fading shape, he saw the witches watching him intently. Beside him, Howell said, The only chance you'd have is if there was another heir. But you don't remember any brothers and sisters, do you? I don't remember anyone. Howell, I... There was another ferocious argument among the witches, and then McGrath was striding, striding across the hall, moving like a tidal wave, moving like a rush of blood to the head, shaking off Granny Weatherwax's restraining hand, bearing down on the throne like a piston, and dragging the fool behind her. I say... Uh... hello -y. Uh... I say, excuse me, can anyone hear us? The castle up above was full of hubbub and general rejoicing, and there was no one to hear the polite and frantic voices that echoed among the dungeon passages, getting politer and more frantic with each passing hour. Um, I say, excuse me? Billum's got this terrible thing about rats, if you don't mind. Cooey! Let the camera of the mind's eye pan slowly back along the dim, ancient corridors, taking in the dripping fungi, the rusting chains, the damp, the shadows. Can't anyone hear us? Look, this is really too much. There's been some laughable mistake. Look, the wigs come right off. Let the plaintive echoes dwindle among the cobwebbed corners, the rodent-hunted tunnels until there are no more than a reedy whisper on the cusp of hearing. I say! I say, excuse me! Help! Someone is bound to come down here again, one of these days. Sometime afterwards, McGrath asked Howell if he believed in long engagements. The dwarf paused in the task of loading up the latte, at least of supervising the loading. Actual physical assistance was a little difficult because he had, the day before, slipped on something and broken his leg. About a week maximum, he said at last, with matinees, of course. A month went past. The early, damp earth odours of autumn drifted over the velvety dark moors, where the watery starlight was echoed by one spark of fire. The standing stone was back in its normal place, but still poised to run if any auditors came into view. The witches sat in careful silence. This was not going to rate among the hundred most exciting coven meetings of all time. If Mazorsky had seen them, the night on the bare mountain would have been over by tea time. Then Granny Weatherwax said, It was a good banquet, I thought. I was nearly sick, said Nanny Og, and my shell helped out in the kitchen and brought me home some scraps. I heard, said Granny coldly. Half a pig and three bottles of fizzy wine went missing, they say. It's nice that some people think of the old folk, said Nanny Og, completely unabashed. I got a coronation mug, too. She produced it. It says, Viva Varence the Second Rex. Fancy him being called Rex. I can't say it's a good likeness, mind you. I don't recall him having a handle sticking out of his ear. There was another long, terribly polite pause. Then Granny said, We were a bit surprised you weren't there, McGrath. 
We thought you'd be up at the top table kind of thing, said Nanny. We thought you'd have moved in up there. McGrath stared fixedly at her feet. I wasn't invited, she said meekly. Well, I don't know about invited, said Granny. We weren't invited. People don't have to invite witches. They just know we'll turn up if we want to. They soon find room for us, he added with some satisfaction. You see, he's been very busy, said McGrath to her feet. Sorting everything out, you know. He's very clever, you know. Underneath. Very sober, lad, said Nanny. Anyway, it's full moon, said McGrath quickly. You've got to go to coven meetings at full moon, no matter what other pressing engagements they may be. Have you? Nanny Og began, but Granny nudged her sharply in the ribs. It's a very good thing he's paying so much attention to getting the kingdom working again, said Granny soothingly. It shows proper consideration. I dare say he'll get around to everything sooner or later. It's very demanding being a king. Yes, said McGrath, her voice barely audible. The silence that followed was almost solid. It was broken by Nanny in a voice as bright and brittle as ice. Well, I bought a bottle of that fizzy wine with me, she said, in case he... In case, in case we felt like a drink, she rallied and waved it at the other two. I don't want any, said McGrath sullenly. You drink up, girl, said Granny Weatherwax. It's a chilly night. It'll be good for your chest. She squinted at McGrath as the moon drifted out from behind its cloud. Here, yeah, she said. Your hair looks a bit grubby. It looks as though you haven't washed it for a month. McGrath burst into tears. The same moon shone down on the otherwise unremarkable town of Ram Nitz, some ninety miles from Lancre. Tom John left the stage to thunderous applause at the concluding act of The Troll of Ankh. A hundred people would go home tonight wondering whether trolls were really as bad as they had hitherto thought, although, of course, this wouldn't actually stop them disliking them in any way whatsoever. Howell patted him on the back as he sat down at the makeup table and started scraping off the thick grey sludge that was intended to make him look like a walking rock. Well done, he said. That love scene, just right. And when you turned around and roared at the wizard... I shouldn't think there was a dry seat in the house. I know. Howell rubbed his hands together. We can afford a tavern tonight, he said. So if we just... We'll sleep in the carts, said Tom John firmly, squinting at himself in the shard of mirror. But you know how much the fault... The king gave us. It could be feather beds all the way home. It's straw mattresses and a good profit for us, said Tom John, and that'll buy you gods from heaven and demons from hell and the wind and the waves and more trapdoors than you can count, my lawn ornament. Howell's hand rested on Tom John's shoulder for a moment. Then he said, You're right, boss. Certainly I am. How's the play going? Huh? What play? said Howell innocently. Tom John carefully removed a plaster brow ridge. He said. That one, the Lancre King. Oh, coming along. Coming along, you know. I'll get it right one of these days. Howell changed the subject with speed. You know, we could work our way down the river and take a boat home. That would be nice, wouldn't it? But we could work our way home, overland, and pick up some more cash. That would be better, wouldn't it? Tom John grinned. We took one hundred and threepence tonight. I counted heads during the judgment speech. That's nearly one silver piece after expenses. You're your father's son, and no mistake, said Howell. Tom John sat back and looked at himself in the mirror. Yes, he said. I thought I'd better be. 
Magrat didn't like cats and hated the idea of mouse traps. She'd always felt that it should be possible to come to some sort of arrangement with creatures like mice, so that all available food was rationed in the best interests of all parties. This was a very humanitarian outlook, which is to say that it was not a view shared by mice, and therefore her moonlit kitchen was alive. When there was a knocking at the door, the entire floor appeared to rush towards the walls. After a few seconds, the knocking came again. There was another pause. Then the knocking rattled the door on its hinges, and a voice cried, Open in the name of the king! The second voice said in hurt tones, You don't have to shout like that. Why did you shout like that? I didn't order you to shout like that. It's enough to frighten anybody shouting like that. Sorry, sir. It goes with the job, sire. Just knock again a bit more gently, please. The knocking might have been a bit softer. Magrat's apron dropped off its hook on the back of the door. I'm sure I can't do it myself. It's not done, sire. King's knocking at humble cottage doors. Best leave it to me. Open in the... Sergeant! Sorry, sir. Forgot myself. Try the latch. It was the sound of someone being extremely hesitant. Don't like the sound of that, sir, said the invisible sergeant. Could be dangerous. If you want my advice, sir, I'd set fire to the thatch. Set fire? Yes, sir. We always do that if they don't answer the door. Brings them out a treat. I don't think that would be appropriate, sergeant. I think I'll try the latch if it's all the same to you. Breaks my heart to see you do it, sir. Well, I'm sorry. You could at least let me buff it up for you. No. Well, couldn't I just set fire to the privy? Absolutely not. That chicken house over there looks as if it could go up like a... Sergeant! Sir? Go back to the castle. What? Leave you all alone, sir? This is a matter of extreme delicacy, Sergeant. I'm sure you are a man of sterling qualities, but there are times when even a king needs to be alone... Concerns a young woman, you understand. Ah, point taken, sire. Thank you. Help me dismount, please. Sorry about all that, sire. Tap us on me. Don't mention it. If you need any help getting her a light... Please, go back to the castle, sergeant. Yes, sire. If you're sure, sire. Thank you, sire. Sergeant? Yes, sire. I shall need someone to take my cap and bells back to the Fool's Guild in Ark Moorpork. Now I'm leaving. It seems to me you're the ideal man. Thank you, sir. Much obliged. It's your... Ah, burning desire to be of service. Yes, sir? Make sure they put you up in one of the guest rooms. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. There was the sound of a horse trotting away. A few seconds later, the latch clonked, and the fool crept in. It takes considerable courage to enter a witch's kitchen in the dark, but probably no more than it takes to wear a purple shirt with velvet sleeves and scalloped edges. It had this in its favour, though. There were no bells on it. He had bought a bottle of sparkling wine and a bouquet of flowers, both of which had gone flat during the journey. He laid them on the table and sat down by the embers of the fire. He rubbed his eyes. It had been a long day. Wasn't he felt a good king, but he'd had a lifetime of working hard at being something he wasn't cut out to be, and he was persevering. As far as he could see, none of his predecessors had tried at all. So much to do, so much to repair, so much to organise. On top of it all, there was the problem with the Duchess. Somehow, he'd felt moved to put her in a decent cell, in an airy tower. She was a widow, after all. He felt he ought to be kind to widows. But being kind to the Duchess didn't seem to achieve much. She didn't understand it. She thought it was just weakness. He was dreadfully afraid that he might have to have her head cut off. No, being a king was no laughing matter. He brightened up at the thought. There was that to be said about it. 
and after a while, he fell asleep. The Duchess was not asleep. She was currently halfway down the castle wall on a rope of knotted sheets, having spent the previous day gradually chipping away the mortar around the bars of her window, although, in truth, you could hack your way out of the average Lanka castle wall with a piece of cheese. The fool! He'd given her cutlery and plenty of bedclothes. That was how these people reacted. They let their fear do their thinking for them. They were scared of her. Even when they thought they had her in their power, and the weak never had the strong in their power, never truly in their power. If she'd thrown herself in prison, she would have found considerable satisfaction in making herself regret she'd ever been born. But they'd just given her blankets and worried about her. Well, she'd be back. There was a big world out there, and she knew how to pull the levers that made people do what she wanted. She wouldn't burden herself with a husband this time, either. Weak? He was the worst of them. No courage in him to be as bad as he knew he was, inside. She landed heavily on the moss, paused to catch her breath, and then, with the knife ready in her hand, slipped away along the castle walls and into the forest. She'd go all the way down to the far border and swim the river there, or maybe build a raft. By morning, she'd be too far away for them ever to find her, and she doubted very much that they'd ever come looking. Weak! She moved through the forest with surprising speed. There were tracks, after all, wide enough for carts, and she had a pretty good sense of direction. Besides, all she needed to do was go downhill. If she found the gorge, then she just had to follow the flow. And then there seemed to be too many trees. There was still a track, and it went more or less in the right direction, but the trees on either side of it were planted rather more thickly than one might expect. And when she tried to turn back, there was no track at all behind her. She took to turning suddenly, half expecting to see the trees moving, but they were always standing stoically and firmly rooted in the moss. She couldn't feel a wind, but there was a sighing in the treetops. All right, she said under her breath. All right, I'm going anyway. I want to go, but I will be back. It was at this point that the track opened out into a clearing that hadn't been there the day before and wouldn't be there tomorrow. A clearing in which the moonlight glittered off assembled antlers and fangs and serried ranks of glowing eyes. The weak, banded together, can be pretty despicable. But it dawned on the Duchess that an alliance of the strong can be more of an immediate problem. There was total silence for a few seconds, broken only by faint panting, and then the Duchess grinned, raised her knife, and charged at the lot of them. The front ranks of the massed creatures opened to let her pass, and then closed in again. Even the rabbits. The kingdom exhaled. On the moors, under the very shadow of the peaks, the mighty nocturnal chorus of nature had fallen silent. The crickets had ceased their chirping, the owls had hooted themselves into silence, and the wolves had other matters to attend to. There was a song that echoed and boomed from this and resounded up the high hidden valleys, causing miniature avalanches. It funneled along the secret tunnels under glaciers, losing all meaning as it rang between the walls of ice. To find out what was actually being sung, you would have to go all the way back down to the dying fire by the standing stone, where the cross resonances and waves of conflicting echoes focused on a small elderly woman who was waving an empty bottle. With a snail, if you slow to a crawl, but the hedgehog. It tastes better at the bottom of the bottle, doesn't it? McGrath said, trying to drown out the chorus. That's right, said Granny, draining her cup. Is there any more? 
I think Gaius has finished it by the sound of it. They sat on the fragrant heather and stared up at the moon. Well, we've got a king, said Granny, and there's an end of it. It's thanks to you and Nanny, really, said Magrat, and hiccuped. Why? None of them would have believed me if you hadn't spoken up. Only because we was asked, said Granny. Yes, but everyone knows witches don't lie. That's the important thing. I mean, everyone could see they looked so alike. But that could have been coincidence. You see, McGrath blushed. I looked up Dois de Seigneur. Goody Wimper had a dictionary. Nanny Og stopped singing. Yes, said Granny Weatherwax. Well, McGrath became aware of an uncomfortable atmosphere. You did tell the truth, didn't you? She said. They really are brothers, aren't they? Oh, yes, said Geyser Og. Definitely. I saw to his mother when your... when the new king was born. And to the queen when young Tom John was born, and she told me who the father was. Gaita? Sorry. The wine was going to her head, but the wheels in McGrath's mind still managed to turn. Just a minute, she said. I remember the fool's father, said Nanny Og, speaking slowly and deliberately. Very personable young man he was. He didn't get on with his dad, you know, but he used to visit sometimes to see old friends. He made friends easily, said Granny. Among the ladies, agreed Nanny. Very athletic, wasn't he? Could climb walls like nobody's business, I remember hearing. He was very popular at court said Granny. I know that much. Oh, yes, with the Queen, at any rate. The King used to go out hunting such a lot, said Granny. It was that dwarf of his, said Nanny. Always out and about with it, he was. Hardly ever home at night. Just a minute, McGrath repeated. They looked at her. Yes, said Granny. You told everyone they were brothers and that Varence was the older. That's right. And you let everyone believe that... Granny Weatherwax pulled her shawl around her. We're bound to be truthful, she said. But there's no call to be honest. No, no. <laughs> what you're saying is that the King of Lancre isn't really... What I'm saying is, said Granny firmly, that we've got a king who is no worse than most and better than many and who's got his head screwed on right. Even if it is against the thread, said Nanny. And the old king's ghost has been laid to rest happy. There's been an enjoyable coronation. And some of us got mugs we weren't entitled to. Them being only for the kiddies, and all in all, things are a lot more satisfactory than they might be. That's what I'm saying. Never mind what should be, or what might be, or what ought to be. It's what things are that's important. But he's not really a king. He might be, said Nanny. But you just said... Who knows? The late queen wasn't very good at counting. Anyway, he doesn't know he isn't royalty. And you're not going to tell him, are you? said Granny Weatherwax. McGrath stared at the moon, which had a few clouds across it. No, she said. Right then, said Granny. Anyway, look at it like this. Royalty has to start somewhere, and might as well start with him. It looks as though he means to take it seriously, which is a lot further than most of them take it. He'll do. 
Magrat knew she had lost. You always lost against Granny Weatherwax. The only interest was in seeing exactly how. But I'm surprised at the two of you. I really am, she said. You're witches. That means you have to care about things like truth and tradition and destiny, don't you? That's where you've been getting it all wrong, said Granny. Destiny is important, see? But people go wrong when they think it controls them. It's the other way around. Bugger destiny, agreed Nanny. Granny glared at her. After all, you never thought being a witch was going to be easy, do you? I'm learning, said Magrat. She looked across the moor, where a thin rind of dawn glowed on the horizon. I think I'd better be off, she said. It's getting early. Me too, said Nanny Og. Oh, sure, Fretz, if I'm not home when she comes to get my breakfast. Granny carefully scuffed over the remains of the fire. When shall we three meet again, she said. Hmm? The witches looked at one another sheepishly. I'm a bit busy next month, said Nanny. Birthdays and such. Um, and the work has really been piling up with all this hurly-burly, you know. And there's all the ghosts to think about. I thought you sent them back to the castle, said Granny. Well, they didn't want to go, said Nanny vaguely. To be honest, I've got used to them around the place. They're company of an evening. They hardly scream at all now. That's nice, said Granny. What about you, McGrath? There always seems to be such a lot to do at this time of year, don't you find? said McGrath. Quite, said Granny Weatherwax pleasantly. It's no good getting yourself tied down to appointments all the time, is it? Let's just leave the whole question open, shall we? They nodded. And as the new day wound across the landscape, each one busy with her own thoughts, each one a witch alone, they went home. There is a school of thought that says that witches and wizards can never go home. They went, though, just the same.